for the benefit, if you miss class, everything's up there, okay? Um, and I'll talk about that in a moment. So, cell phones, laptops, tablets. I just started including this policy a couple of years ago, and at the beginning it was just, you know, it's really short. And it's kind of grown and grown and grown because last couple of years, man, I don't know what's going on with students, what they're putting in the water supply or something, but I'm getting all kinds of weird behaviors in classrooms. Like, not picking on anybody. Different classroom. You know, I was standing over there. The student was sitting back here. First, in literally about the first three weeks of class, she's sitting there taking selfies for about the first 30 minutes of a 55 minute class. And I finally go, I can't remember her name, Jordan, Judith, something like that. Judy, put it down. She failed because she couldn't, you know, turn outward. She couldn't focus on anything other about herself. I mean, she eventually just kind of drifted away. But I'm, selfies. Real, man. So, use of cell phones for calls, texting, so, and I'm going to assume that if you've got a phone and your hands are under the desk and your hands are doing this, I'm going to assume it's texting and that's something weird going on. So, selfies, etc. just don't, okay? If you're a first responder, because I've had in, in quite a few of my classes, I'd have cops, I'd have EMTs, um, I've had firefighters, let me know. You can keep your phone out, you can keep it on silent. That way, if it starts buzzing, you just pick it up, take your stuff, and leave. No questions asked. Similarly, okay, if right now you have some kind of significant, serious family situation going on, particularly, you know, it's a family illness. You have somebody in your family who has a terminal disease, terminal as in they're expected to go soon. Or that happens in the course of the semester. You know, your father, your mother has a stroke, has a heart attack. Uh, one of them gets diagnosed with cancer. All three have happened. Almost every semester for about the last five years, in almost every one of my classes, somebody has had something like that um, happen. One, take care of the situation that you need to immediately. I mean, don't think about me, don't think about the class, don't think about MTSU. Think about your family member, get done what needs to be done. But within 24 hours, send me an email that just says, Dr. Sherman, such and such has happened. You do not have to go into the gory details, okay? It's none of my business, first of all. But you do need to let me know, and you need to let me know how it's going to affect you in class. It might be... You know, something happens early October, and you can no longer make it Thursday evenings. I will do everything I can to ensure you are able to complete this class. Okay? It might be you no longer physically are here, but you watch all the videos, and you do all the assigned work. Okay? I have a student that had, happened with a student last fall. Hers happened early. There were a couple issues there. There was one family related, related issue and then she was having some anxiety issues as a, as a result of that. And she had really bad agoraphobia. She, she couldn't be around other people in groups. It just freaked her out. Like second week of class, she stopped attending. I heard from her about two or three weeks later. We kind of worked things out. She still passed the class. It wasn't a great grade, but it was a C or C minus, which is better than an F, okay? So if you let me know immediately within 24 hours or so, I will do everything I can to make sure that you can pass the class. If, however, you do what two students in the spring did, and you disappear in the middle of the semester, like before or right about midterm time, and I literally don't hear anything from you until the Monday of exams week. Two students did that, two different courses this, this spring. And you say, 
Oh, I had X, Y, Z happen. Too bad. <laughs> I'm sorry that that happened to you or your family, but at that point, there's nothing I can, I can't even give you really an incomplete. If you had let me know beforehand, and you struggled and struggled and struggled and just couldn't get the work done, yeah, then I grant the incomplete. But when you just, you know, completely block everybody out, and usually if you have that kind of, you know, situation arise or happen, don't just email me. All your professors, let them know, okay? Most of us are relatively nice people. We will try to, you know, make sure that you can succeed um, to the best of your ability, all right? So, um, what else? Strongly discourage the use of laptops and tablets. Doesn't mean those of you who have them open, you need to close them. I did this the other night, and all of a sudden, you know, people start slapping down their mats. Um, why? I used to have an asterisk here, and after this paragraph, I had links to about a half dozen different articles, okay? Scholarly articles about the impact of taking notes by a laptop as opposed to taking notes by hand. And the studies are pretty conclusive. Students who take notes by hand perform better, aka get better grades, than do those who take notes by uh, laptop. It's something about the brain filtering and when you're doing this, you're merely trying to transcribe. When you're doing this, your brain's filtering out unneeded information and you're focusing much better okay so but if you want to take notes by laptop etc have it but and yeah I've actually got to mention this if I see which I probably won't because I'm up here you're up there if I see or someone tells me that you're using your computer cell phone laptop tablet etc for Facebook email messaging Internet searching, Pornhub, yes, that's the one I've got to mention because it's happened before. I've had a student say behind and go, you know, Dr. Sherman, can you talk to, you know, because there's all these naked people bouncing around on the screen. And I'm like, I'm not even going to go there. That person's name's going to get immediately sent to judicial affairs. And <laughs> for that kind of thing, your ass can be out of the university faster than you can imagine. Why? Because you've broken about a half dozen different MTSU policies. When you agree to use the Wi-Fi, you agree not to search the internet for porn. Okay? So just, you know, be forewarned. Um, so I'll tell you to stop. Then I'll, if it's really bad, I'll just, you know, call the cops on you, etc. Okay. <laughs> Classroom decorum. Absolutely hate this word. Um, because I'm always turning around. I get dizzy. Classroom decorum. Attendance, participation, and decorum are expected. What's decorum? It's an old Latin word. We don't hear it anymore today. It's a good word. It means good behavior, proper behavior, proper manners. It's, I don't mean, you know, I'm an old fashion, traditional chauvinist, etc. It doesn't mean men open the door for the women when they come in and pull the seat. It doesn't mean that. It does mean be nice to each other. If you disagree with somebody, don't call them an ignorant slob. Just disagree with them. And I hope maybe we will have some arguments. Argument's fun. Okay? So, here's what decorum means for the purposes of this class. One, arrive on time. Okay? If you know that you can't get here at 6 o'clock, you've got another class, I don't know, in the rec center, it gets out at 5.45 or 5.40, and you're walking, and your leg's in a cast, and you're driving it, you know, it's going to take you longer than 20 minutes to get here. Uh, if you have a job and you don't get off till 5.45, and you're going to be here, let me know. Just let me know ahead of time. It won't be a problem, okay? If you don't let me know, and you keep coming in 30 minutes late, and I'm going to start thinking you're a slacker. Why? Because you're a slacker. Okay. Um, so just <laughs> let me know. Okay. Um, number two, <clears throat> you're quiet. You pay attention. If I'm talking, which is probably going to be the case, uh, pay attention to me, or at least be quiet. Um, or if, if somebody else is talking, listen to them. Okay. Three, 
courteous to others. That's, we talked about that. Just be nice to each other. Four, when speaking in class, you should use language appropriate to the setting. That is, we're not at a bar. Now, I've already broken this a little bit. You know, I've said ass, I've said hell, I've said damn. Yeah, those are going to come out every now and then. No F-bombs. No, you know, um, sex organ slang. Okay, just leave it out. Um, I've actually had a student before. It was my, I think it was this exact class, Monday night class. And, I mean, every other word was the F word. I was like, dude, you know, clean it up a little bit, you know. Make it every third word at least. <laughs> Sheesh. Word doesn't have that many meanings in the dictionary of slang. Um, don't eat during class. You know, if it's something soft, like a sandwich, I don't have a problem with that. I mean, for most of you, this is probably more or less dinner time. But don't come in with a bag of crunchy Doritos or extra crunchy Cheetos or something that's real crunchy. That the person next to you is going to start, you know, having a fit or something. Um, don't sleep. Shouldn't be a problem because this is the 6 o'clock in the evening class. But if you do, I will probably, you might want to grab your stuff. I will probably come up and do something like that. It's really fun for 8 o'clock classes because I'll have students fall asleep. And I'll do that. And the head bops up, bangs back down, and everybody laughs. And shame is a good motivator to not do what you were doing. Okay? <laughs> Or as I've once done, I'll just kind of go, and everybody leaves. And that person wakes up, oh, an hour, two hours later maybe, and everybody's gone. And realizes, everybody knew I fell asleep in class. And it doesn't happen again. Um, what else? Don't do homework or assignments for other classes during my class. Similarly, don't read my books in somebody else's class. That's just out and out rude. Just don't do it. I, I had this one class last fall or the fall before. It was a night class. I don't think it was this one. It was my token rolling course. And there's a girl, and she'd come in every day, and she'd sit literally right here. And I'm standing right here. And she'd open this, like, 8,000-page biology textbook and not have any of the books we were doing. And, and just, and I'm like, she didn't do very well. She passed, but she didn't do very well. Um, not because I, you know, penalized her. She obviously didn't pay any attention. Um, what else? This is a new one. I had to add this because of a student last spring. Don't wear headphones or earbuds during the class. Perfectly fine if you walk in and they're stuck in your ears. But when you come in, pull them out. I had this one guy who would come in every morning, and he sat kind of in the back corner, and he'd come in and keep them in. And there were a couple days, because I said something to him in class about it, where I'm standing up here, I'm talking, and I can hear the beat from back there. <laughs> and I'm thinking, if I, who am you know, losing some of my hearing, if I can hear the beat up here, the people sitting next to them, you know, they've got a little lead on like this. <laughs> yeah, I'll tell you to stop, okay? Obviously, don't cheat or plagiarize from somebody else. Um, and come prepared to participate in class. What does that mean? This is brand new. I just wrote this, these sentences four or five days ago. Starting my 27th year here, my 30th year teaching. I've never had to include this. Two of my courses last spring, one was this course, and another one was a Tolkien rolling course, Lord of the Rings and Harry Potter course. Um, literally half the people in each class never brought anything to class, other than cell phones, purses, you know, that kind of thing. No books, nothing to write on. They just came in and sat. Some of them slept. Some of them got on their phones, etc. Okay. Um, let me use the analogy. One of my colleagues used with me this morning because he, you know, it's the beginning of the semester. We're already bitching about students at each other. Okay. You're a tennis player. You have a tennis match. What do you make sure you have? 
for that match. Racket. Yeah, your racket. If you're a football player, you have your equipment. If you're a hockey player, you've got your stick. If you're in an English class, a literature course, what do you have with you? The literature. You have the material with you. Now, you might have it like this. Where'd it go? You might have it like this. And that's fine. I had one student sat right here, iPad, open it up every day, pulled up the book. Some of these books, all of these books, all of these books are available via Kindle. Some of them are available via illegal PDF versions, okay? So you don't have to pay for them. I don't remember which ones. I don't think these are, but the Kindle price is not very much for these. Okay? Those are on PDF. These are on PDF, okay? <laughs> <laughs> There's a man to talk. <laughs> I didn't set that up. It just worked out really well. First time I tried to teach my Harry Potter course in London using electronic text. I spent hours searching for bootleg versions of the Harry Potter novels. They're all available. You don't have to go through the Pottermore store and you know all that kind of thing. You can find, you can find illegal versions, but it was a lot harder. And what year was that? Two thousand seven, I think it was. I mean, that was when electronic tests were so pretty early, okay? Um, so, bring a book, not just any book. I told my Monday night class, oh, I need to correct that, because I said in theirs, this means that you bring a book to class. I said, oh, stop. It means you bring the correct book to class. So don't come in and bring, you know, I don't know, Game of Thrones or something like that, okay? <laughs> Students who come without a book, and or a means to take notes. And this is, I have to include this. You'll be penalized five points if I catch you. It doesn't mean I'm going to suddenly revert to this is like fifth grade. All right, everybody, show me your book. Show me your paper. Show me your pencil. I'm not going to do that. But I will mentally, I'll be able to see because I'm pretty aware, right? And especially if you're just kind of slumped up against the wall, as two or three of those students were, okay, that'll be pretty clear, all right? It doesn't mean you have to, you know, fill a notebook every night. Hands get tired, I understand all that. Again, remember, everything is recorded and on YouTube, okay? Now, it doesn't mean you shouldn't take notes. I would still take notes. I took lots of notes in school. And I'll tell you right now, I have got a great retention. I can read something, and I can read it once, and I can tell you that if you open a book on what part of the page something occurs, whether it's on the, you know, like this, I can say, well, it's on one of these pages, and it's towards the bottom. I can't tell you exactly what it is. I know, I've known people who have the proverbial photographic memory. They can tell you exactly where something occurs. That is, on what page and what number word it is on the page. Because their minds work weirdly. You know, mathematics and literature mixed together. Okay. Not me. Um, what I was getting back to about the YouTube, though, what some students have told me helps them. This is not me. This is them saying this. Personally, me, it would put me to sleep. Or drive me to... <laughs> They've converted those YouTube things to MP3 and put them in the car, put them, listen to them while they drive to work or school. Especially, and I've had two or three students who've had hour long commutes who've told me that's what they've done. Okay. Similarly, audiobooks. If you have difficulty reading novels, I got a student in my Monday night class, all he reads, he says, nonfiction. It's it. He never reads novels. He's reading Lord of the Rings and Harry Potter novels. <laughs> one book a week. The Fellowship of the Ring one night. Two Towers another night. Return of the King another night. We're done with the Lord of the Rings in three weeks. Harry Potter. First book. Actually, we do the first two books in one night. They're fluffy. They're like marshmallow. Second book. Third book's a little bit more. One night. Uh, fourth book. A lot thicker. I've only got one night. Order of the Phoenix. It's like 880 pages long. Okay, I've got two to three nights for that. 
But that's still, man, that is not much time. He's like, how am I going to do this? Bless you, Mike. But, you, know. <laughs> <laughs> you better find a way. So, you know, I recommend the audio books, Lord of the Rings. There's a, there's a dramatized version that's really good, a radio version done from the 1970s. Uh, stay away from the films because they totally change things and add things, et cetera, et cetera. So all these, I think all of these are also available in audio versions. That'd be another way, you know, kill some time listening to them. Um, so, so if you don't abide by these guidelines, I'll talk to you. If you persist, you'll get kicked out of class. Okay? That's the long and the short of it. So we'll cover a great, medil, a great deal of material each class period, obviously, one three-hour period. So try not to miss what happens if you do. I've given you, out of the kindness of my heart, one answer. Do with it what you want, or don't do with it. Hmm. What does that mean? It means you cannot show up, and it doesn't affect your grade. But a second one will result in a one-letter grade reduction. That's the end of the semester. You're pulling an A, you're doing really well, and you missed a class, that's fine. Or you decide, you know, I'm going to go get drunk early. It's a Monday. Weird, but go ahead. <laughs> and you're going to miss class. And that's your second absence. Well, that stellar A just became a B. Let's say you're just scraping the bottom of the bucket. You just got that bare 60, which is a D. And you get that second absence, you just failed the course. Okay? A third absence, which is actually a little bit more than one fourth, because I'm not counting tonight really. Um, will result in failure of the course. It's one fourth of the semester. If you miss one fourth of the semester in any class, you ought to fail it, period. Just, you know, out and out. A 15 week semester, that's essentially missing, essentially, four weeks. Really. If you can't come for more than that. So, if you're not present, either when roll is taken or if there's a quiz, when the quiz has begun, you'll be counted absent. Now, that's not quite true. If I've handed out the quiz, and, you know, I'm going to get people somewhere usually between 5 to 10 minutes. It's usually more like 5 to 7. If I've handed out the quiz, and it's only been a couple minutes, I'll give it to you. If, however, they've got about a minute left, I probably won't, right? And if I do, I'll say, you got about... 55 seconds, so write fast, you know. But I won't give you any additional time for that, right? If you know you have to miss class, let me know ahead of time. Because nine times out of ten, I'll say, okay, fine. And that won't count against you, even if you've already missed the one. If it's a good reason, if it's, you know, Doc, I don't know what's coming up on Netflix or whatever, but Dr. Sherman, you know, some friends and I, we want to get together and binge watch, you know, some new show coming out on that's not going to cut. If, you know, my cousin was in a car wreck this weekend and I need to go visit in the hospital. Guess what? Why are you here? Just go already, okay? That's the kind of thing you send me an email about, right? Where am I? Here we go. <clears throat> okay. So, what else? No makeup quizzes or exams will be given. So if you miss a quiz... You just miss it. You just get a zero on it. Okay. Uh, exams we'll talk about in a moment. Papers are due at the beginning of class on these side days. Unapproved late papers will receive an F. If you let me know before the paper is due, paper means exam. You're not writing any additional literary critical essays, etc. Why? None of you guys are English major. You don't. It's stupid for us to require you to do that in my opinion, okay? Um, and if anything, that's going to make you hate literature more than it'll make you enjoy it. I want to make you try to enjoy it. So, uh, this is referring to exams. If something happens in the week between when I give out the exam topics and when that exam is due, and you email me, okay, and we go back and forth a little bit, I'll probably give you more time. It might not be a full week. I might say take a couple more days and email it to me, for example, okay? 
If you don't say anything to me and the day comes when it's due and you don't have it, you're going to get an F. I won't read it. I'll just put F. But turn it in. Even if it ends up being a couple weeks late, turn it in. Why? Because when I put an F on a paper, there is F, 55. And F equals 55 points. You don't turn in the paper or the exam. You automatically fail the course. Okay? So turn it in late. I, it, literally, that applies to, you know, you don't do the first exam and you finally turn it in the last week of class. You'll get a 55. You don't turn it in, you automatically fail the course. If you don't turn it in, when is, when is that first week? If you don't turn it in, let's see, 10 3, yeah, that doesn't help. Um, 10 10, the exam's due. That's actually just before fall break when, when midterm uh, grades are due. So I'll, have, I'll either have something else, like quizzes maybe over some of this stuff to determine your grade, or I'll just, you know, put some kind of boilerplate comment like, so-and-so is attending class and there's been nothing to be graded on. The only reason we have to do those midterm grades, the federal government, sticking their blankety butt nose with those. <laughs> um, <clears throat> makes me so mad. <coughs> okay. So, semester course grades, really easy to figure out. You got three exams, 300 points total. Maybe quizzes, probably quizzes. I don't know if there'll be every night. It's possible. So if there are, let's say 10 quizzes. Let's say I drop one, right? Because I probably would. So quizzes, 10 points each, that's another 100 points. So you have 400 points total possible. However many points you earn, divide by that 400, that gives me a number. That number is somewhere between 100 and zero. Wherever that number falls, that's what you're doing. If it's 0.5 or higher, it gets bumped up, okay? So, schedule, everything clear so far? Should be. Schedule below shows the days by which you must have finished reading each novel so that we can profitably discuss it that evening. Notice, because we will likely get behind in our class discussions, keep up with the reading schedule. That is, we might be struggling here. I might not have quite finished and Luke of San Martin. Still, have goals I got for that night. Again, notice, there is no slowdown. In fact, if anything, because the length of the novels gets longer, each night gets worse <laughs> in terms of the amount of reading <laughs> you have to do. Each night, in one sense, gets better in terms of what we cover because that's it. This stuff's pretty cool on its own. This stuff's cool on its own way. This stuff's cool in its totally different own way. So each night has its own thing, but the books get long. Stroud and, and Nick's long, thick, meaty books. Yes? All right, so like on Tech 17, we have to have the golems I done by that class? Yes. Okay. Yes. So... I think in one email I said, oh, I can't remember because I kept messing up emails in the wrong emails in the wrong class. You know, Alexander Booker Three. I think I had asked you, if at all possible, try to read Lloyd Alexander's book for tonight. But notice it's also up for next week. Okay? Because I assumed, even though I sent that email out, I think most people probably wouldn't read it. Some people may not have gotten it. One or two of you may have added after it got sent, right? So you weren't on the roll when the D2L email you know, sent it out. So we'll talk about it next week. But next week we've also got Black Cauldron. Doesn't mean you have to have Black Cauldron done for next week, but it'd be really nice. In case we get through the Book of Three fast. It's probably not going to happen. But we've got through the Black Cauldron next week. So notice, for these, I double them all up. Hoping, hoping I can get a little bit ahead. 30 years of teaching, and it hasn't happened yet. Why? Because I can't shut up. <laughs> um, so we finish Alexander, October 3rd, 
We have the High King, the last novel in the Chronicles of Printing series, and I'll give you the exam that night. Okay? And you will bring it back the following Thursday night. That is the Thursday night before fall break begins. Okay? We come back from fall break, and you have this. Now, that exam, there's going to be a comment about it later. That exam. So, like, on the 10th, we have to come back with the essay done and that reading done. Yeah, essentially. Okay. Yep. But the essay's not going to be real long, right? Um, 750 to 1,000 word exam. That's roughly about two and a half to three and a half pages of Times New Roman 12 point type. And I'll be very specific on the, on the sheet that gets distributed. Why? When I was first teaching, when I was a doctoral student, I gave an assignment as a beginning, as a, like a first semester freshman writing class, and I told the students to come in the next day with, I think it was, you know, one page about something. And a student came in with everything typed in font like this size. It was literally like maybe 100 words. And I just wrote on it, how stupid do you think I am? And gave it to him and never saw him again. <laughs> so it'll tell you what size font to use, what font to use, not to use curly fonts and bright rainbow colors and you know, you can be all rainbowy you want, but not on um, paper. White paper, I've, I've gotten pink paper and chartreuse paper and camo paper. Whatever kind of paper you want, you can find. Okay? So, you'll write three of these. That first one, you'll probably have, in fact, each of them, will probably have anywhere from four, maybe three, to as many as eight or nine different topics. Choose one. Surely, out of those three to nine, three to eight, something there will pique your interest. If it doesn't, pretend that it does. Okay? <laughs> and write what you can best write about that. No library research, no internet, re nothing. you don't need to look at anything else. Just the books that are included for that exam. Okay? And notice this, and this will be on the exam sheet again. For each exam, you must have at least one, and I've had to throw in this word, I'll explain why in a moment, substantive, direct quotation, not paraphrase or summary, but direct quotation, for each of the books the examination covers. So, for the Lloyd Alexander exam, you're going to have quotations from how many books? Five, thank you, we can do math. Because I've gotten this before, and I've had five quotations from one book. Right? One quotation from each book that is covered. So in the next series, Stroud's Bartimaeus series, there's only three books. Bare minimum, there will be three quotations, one from each of those three books. Following one, Nix's um, Abhorsen series, there's three books again. So there will be three books quoted, and there will be, at the minimum, three quotations. When I get those papers, I'll put them in order, and the first thing I'll do is I'll turn to the works out and finish. For the first one, the Lloyd Alexander, if there are not the five chronicles of printing, you get an F. And I don't read the paper. Why? You're too stupid to be here. <laughs> okay? And I, I should say that because we're supposed to be nice and supportive, and it's a student learning environment. If you deserve to be a student learning here, okay? If you can't follow simple directions like this, I'm, honest, I'm being deadly honest here. You shouldn't be here. Not everybody should be at a university. There are wonderful colleagues that have nothing to do with the university education. Yes? Um, well, when I read it, I put um, one quote per exam, and because apparently I skipped over from each book. <laughs> so read it carefully. <laughs> And I will, I will say on the exam sheet, you know, and we'll go over it in class. Read the directions carefully. Follow the directions. 
90% of success in life is following the directions. You know, use the tennis analogy again. What happens when you hit the ball outside the line? It's not following the directions of the game. It's got to come inside the line, you know. Rules, rules matter. As much as we want to be anarchists, you know, you know, throw down the man, etc. Okay. So quotations must be properly introduced, formatted, documented. We can talk about that later. Quotations should comprise that it account for no more than 20% of your overall paper. Why? Most of it should be your ideas, your thoughts about whatever the topic is. Okay. So what's a substantive quotation? More than one word. I had to start including that because I had a few students over a couple of semesters, Lord of the Rings, Harry Potter course, they would quote this passage between Gandalf and Frodo, parentheses, citation, that's one quotation, and then they'd have later on, like two sentences later, yes, in quotation marks, page number. It's the very next word after the previous quotation. That's not a substantive quotation. Substantive, somewhere in here, I think I might actually say, it's, you know, something like Tim, yeah, there it is. No more, no more than, say, 30 words long, but no less than 10 words. All right? And I hate, I hate having to do this, specify, because, you know, if I teach much longer, I'm probably going to get to the point what I'm going to do for you, what I, what I do to my kids, who are all adults now. If I want your opinion, I'll give it to you. If I want your quotation, I'll give you the quotation to use. You know? I don't want to do it there. I'm afraid I might have to for some people. So substantive me, they should be relevant to the topic, rich in content. They should be in context. That is, you explain how they mean what they mean, where they are, etc. And then all this other stuff is about what form the papers ought to look, what kind of papers get what kind of grades, stuff about paraphrasing, which doesn't apply to you because you're going to be using direct quotations, and not paraphrases. And then the first page of all papers should look like this. All right? You're not John Smith. <laughs> Nobody in here is me. You laugh. I used to have my name here, Ted Sherman, and then Sherman over here. I had a student turn in a paper once that had my name on it. <laughs> so I handed all the papers back. And because there were one or two missing, I, I wasn't sure whose paper this was. So I handed the papers back that I had. I had their, those papers grades in the grade book, and I had two or three names that didn't have any papers. I had this one that had my name on it, which got an F, because I didn't write the paper. Okay, Somebody else did. Anyways, you know, and this one person kind of sheepishly went, why didn't you get my paper? And I just kind of went, okay. we walked outside. The student was just totally dumbfounded that, you know, he, I can't remember he or she had done this. So I explained why it's an F, et cetera, et cetera, and they, you know, melted into a puddle of you know, tears at that point. <laughs> and at that point, I was really nice, and I said, fix it. <laughs> and the, the student did fix, obviously, that's an easy fix, right? Give me five seconds on the computer, and I'll fix it. Brought it back, and I revised it. I mean, I, I didn't revise it. It didn't go from F to A. It went like F to C without even reading the rest of it, right? Um, I don't know that I'll do that. <laughs> I'm just telling you I did. But, it, you know, then it, the rest of it looks like this. Also, I had, don't begin blah, 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 okay? <laughs> I had a student do that once. Blah, blah, blah. Living and dying well, and, okay? What I said earlier about too stupid to be at the university, so. Um, Okay, any questions about the syllabus and such? Before we go, yeah, one, yeah, go ahead. Okay, so I just put title there. Is that, would that be the title of the book or your specific essay? The title of your essay. And the title of your essay, what did I have? The title of your essay, 
Living and Dying Well in Pradane. Okay, that's the title I came up in here. Assuming that there's a topic about what does living and dying well mean, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? Notice the in Pradane tells me something about the works under discussion. The title should always tell the reader something about what it's about. So it's not just living and dying. I'll do it, okay? Um, it'd be even better living and dying well in quotation marks the chronicles of Pradane, or living and dying well in the high king underlined or italicized as a title because it's a title within a title, okay? But if you come in and the paper doesn't have a title at all, I'll give you one. It's like this. <laughs> and I don't read it. I literally will not read it. I'll put an F, set it aside. By doing that, by the way, if you want to if you want to help me, if you want to be nice, go ahead and do that. Because it just shortens my grading time. Because even though these are relatively short papers, some of these three pages, I can spend 45 minutes on. Now, you think, well, that's not very long. It's gonna take me 45 hours to write this three page paper. No, it won't. Okay, uh, I spent a lot longer than most of my colleagues. Why? When you get it back, no matter what your grade is, I don't use red because that's not nice. It's going to have a lot of blue or black or green ink just spilled all over. There will be a lot of comments. There will be a lot of marks, et cetera, et cetera, even if it's an A. Why? I'm sure there are probably some fantastic writers in here, but you're not as good as you think you are. And you're not as good as you claim to be. And I'll go through and and I'm, I'll tell you right now, I am a born editor. I edited a scholarly journal for six years. I'd get stuff from people who were PhDs who had been PhDs for 40 years, and I'd want to vomit <laughs> upon re because I mean there'd just be all kinds of problems. And I'd go through and change it, send it back, they go, Yeah, that's better. <laughs> Etc. Right? So be just expect. Lots of comments. And one reason I do that, when I was a graduate student, when I was uh, working on my master's, I had this one professor. I had two classes from him. He was the only one who gave me a grade less than an A. Okay? And in both those classes, when I turned in my seminar paper, these were 25 to 30 page papers, neither one literally looked like it had been read. That is, I mean, you can look at something like this, and notice, there are some folds, there's some crinkles. It looks like it's been handled. My paper, when I got it back, looked like it was mint. Virgin paper, never been touched before. <laughs> on all it had on it was, both of them, no comment. Not a single, other than this, not a single mark anywhere on the paper. And I'm like, but because I'm an old-fashioned traditionalist, you know, and I didn't question professor's authority. I'm stupid. I, I didn't question his authority, and I got to be when I did my doctoral work. You know, I made sure. You know, if you're, there are any problems, make comments. And I had some people who, you know, slid a vein and just read all over the thing, etc. Right. So you'll get a lot of comments. Hopefully, they'll be useful. If I'm getting really grumpy and snarky, they might start to get a little sarcastic, and I'll apologize in a head. I try not to, but every now and then, it's just like the shark just <coughs> comes out. Okay? Uh, other comments or questions? Yes? If you do go sarcastic, make sure we know somehow. Yeah, I'll, I'll try. There needs to be a sarcasm class. <laughs> um, a couple of years ago, I was teaching a graduate course. <clears throat> graduate course in Old English. I used to teach Old English in Beowulf, and I teach the great Old English poem Beowulf in Old English. So what they had to do in that course is they translated the entire poem, 3,182 lines, from Old English to Modern English. Um, so I had this student in the Old English course, and he wrote this paper, and his, his big interest was on manifestations or performances of masculinity in literature and stuff. So it's this gender stuff. 
which I personally don't get into. I, I won't go into any other comments about that. So he writes this paper, and I don't remember what the exact topic was, but I'm reading it, and I'm like this, literally the second page in in a 22-page paper, and my blood pressure is just... Because like every other sentence is, one, jargon, and two, assumption. That is, he's making all kinds of assertions that are unsupported. He's assuming certain things to be true. And so I start, you know, making comments. And the more and more I get into it, the comments start to get snarkier and snarkier and snarkier. And somewhere, I can't remember exactly where, about the middle of the page, can't remember his name, Cameron or something like that, Clark or something. I just put, Clark, this is total bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> and I, you know, drew a line from that to the bottom, over to the side, flipped the page, and I just wrote like a page of why everything he had been saying up to that point is just utter nonsense. And Christmas break comes. They don't get their papers back before because, I mean, they gave me those papers the last night of class. And then I've got to grade, you know, 10, 20 to 35 page papers in a week. So if a three page paper could take 45 minutes, imagine how long some of these papers could take. Some of them took me 10 hours. Okay? So I'm literally, you know, round the clock for some of them. Anyway. Next semester begins. He's taking the Beowulf course. That first night of class comes, and I give him all their papers back. And he and I are good, friendly terms. You know, he gets it. And I, can, I just look at people's faces when I give the papers back. You know, some of them are related because one or two people got A's. And his paper, I think, was a B. And he wasn't, you know, upset. But, you know, I'd watch as people read the comments, you know, eyebrows would go up and down, little smirks, frowns, you know, shoulders would go up, shoulders would go down, etc. <laughs> and the next week he comes and, and talks to me and he goes, you know, Dr. Sherman, you're right. <laughs> it was total, and he said, and I didn't even know it. He said, your comments helped me see that an awful lot of what I had read, that is read for that paper, really wasn't based in reality. Based in reality meaning, based on the written text that these people were analyzing, they had done what? They had done something every one of us does. Right? Let, let me pause just one moment. If you need to get up, use a restroom, get some water, feel free. It's a three-hour class. I'll warn you right now. I go straight three hours. Okay? So what do we all do when we approach a written work? We can't help it. We could try, and we should try, right? With ourselves. How? By trying to relate to the book. Okay, we inject ourselves by trying to relate the book. What else? We think of how we would react to their situation. Okay, think of how we would react to their situation. Is that a bad thing? Putting yourself in the role of a, of a character? No, that's what the author wants you to do. The author wants you to become, while you're reading, J.K. Rowling wants you to become, as you're reading, Harry Potter. She wants you to see exactly how Harry sees, and to feel what Harry feels, and what? To react how Harry reacts. See, the Harry Potter novels are designed to teach certain behaviors, right? But what else do we do? Well, we think that we would react more, like, more smarter than okay. in a situation, but, you know, the character could be feeling a fight, fight or flight response, not thinking clearly in the moment, but we're just not in that action. Okay. Why might we not be in that action? I mean, obviously, we're not literally. When, when we start the Black Cauldron next week, or maybe tonight, probably not. You don't suddenly wake up one morning, you pick up a book, you start reading it, and you look around, <laughs> and you're at a farm in Pridane. Where does that farm in Pridane exist? Where? 
in the imagination in your head. Well, how do you know? Was it there before? Not before you read it. That was Not saying. before you read it. Okay. That's taking me down a different trail. I don't want to go to right yet. <laughs> so we're going to hold on to that. Living imagination. So, before we create that imagination, before we create that image in our head, what do we do with this book? We analyze it. How? You're right. What does each one of us bring? Perspective. Think of what that word perspective means. Okay? At the root of it is the spec, like spectacles. A spectacle is something wow to be seen. A spectator sport is something you don't participate in. It's what you watch. Okay? So we're observers, we're watchers. How are, how are our perspectives different? Here's an example. Look at this, okay, and describe what you see. Don't tell me what it is. Describe the thing that you see without telling you what it is. So what do you see? A black, do you know it's a tablet? No, like as in like a stone tablet. Okay, a black thing. Does it have a shape? It's a rectangle. What else? How do you know? Do you know it's a screen? It kind of looks like a mirror to me. Okay. I mean, it's a black mirror. It looks so. kind of like a mirror. Why? It's reflecting. Well, you guys are all blind. Or stupid. Or you're making things up. I mean, yeah, it's black. Oh, because you're on the other side. Bingo. Mm -hmm. Is it reflective other than the little hole? No, it's not. But if I do this, it now has an image on it, right? But from my perspective, it doesn't. See how important perspective is? Because what could two people come to do because of their differing perspective? Argue. And? And? Figure out a better way to do things. Possibly, yeah. if they're logical, kill each other. <laughs> <laughs> kill each other. Over what? Differing perspectives. Why? When I'm standing over here, what's my perspective? From right here. When I'm standing looking at this, what's my per I can't see any of you. You might be sitting, you know, throwing up a bird at me while I've got my back. And I wouldn't know. Okay? Perspective counts for everything. My perspective right now is right here. It's not where he is. It's not yours. Because what's your perspective? You're facing this way. I'm facing this way. Totally different. Okay? So what's that? what creates that perspective? It's not only literally our position, our stance. What else is it? How our brains are different or how we were raised. How our brains are different. We're not all equal. Sorry to you know blow away the big inclusive bubble where we're all equal. We're not. We don't all have the same IQ. Some of us have a little higher. Some of us have, have a little lower. Some people have way, way higher. One of my colleagues has an IQ, if I remember right, of 160 or 180. Literal genius. It's disgusting. <laughs> I know people who are artistically creative out the wazoo, and it drives me crazy. I mean, they can write music, they can play music, they can write poetry and literature, they can draw their paint. It's just not fair that so many people should have to okay? What else did he say? How we're raised. By whom we're raised. My parents, as far as I know, were not any of your parents. <laughs> Some of you might come from what's called a totally functional 
nuclear family, mom, dad, you might have siblings. Some of you might not come from that. Some of you might not have any siblings. Some of you might not know who your parents are. Okay. Some of you might have a nice warm place to live when you leave here tonight. Some of you might be homeless. Got an email from a student the other day. I wasn't in class because I'm homeless. I just lost my place. Okay. How does that affect things? You value things differently. Yeah, it tends, you know, when you're homeless and hungry, what becomes important? Not stupid novels. <laughs> Filling your belly in staying covered during thunderstorms that becomes you know much much more important but stupid novels can do what keep going yes they can they should if they're well written their escapes possibly what kind of perspective they can give us a different perspective that is we might meet somebody in that novel who is homeless and hungry and thirsty. And we can learn to do what? Identify with that individual. We can empathize with them. Not because we've experienced it ourselves, but when we experience it through an imaginary character, guess what? We do experience it. So that maybe then, when we see someone who's actually homeless, we don't go, get a job, you lazy bum. That's one of the things that J.K. Rowling does so well in the Harry Potter novels. You get, you know, Harry's aunt and uncle, who are thoroughly proper middle class, you know, people in England. And what do they think of Harry's parents and other people like Harry's parents? How many of you read the Harry Potter novels? Okay, nice. <clears throat> Vernon calls Harry's dad a layabout. That is, unemployed. He didn't do anything. He was worthless in his mind because he didn't have a job. Well, he did have a job of sorts, right? What was it? He thrice defied Lord Voldemort. That's a pretty big job because Voldemort, you know, he thrice defied Satan. He said, oh, yeah, you Satan, you know, three times. <laughs> kind of didn't live to tell about it afterwards, but we can talk about that later. Okay. So that perspective, you know, literature can, can open our eyes to what? To things we'll never experience. Is anybody in this room ever going to meet Tom Riddle or a Lord Voldemort? Darth Vader? What does Darth Vader mean, by the way? The very name. Not dark. Darth does not mean dark. It means black. And if you know the Star Wars story, what's interesting about Anakin Skywalker? He has no father. Darth Vader is from, Darth is from Old and Middle English. It's not used much. It's pronounced dirt, actually. Vader. That's Dutch. It's just Dutch father, black father. Okay? Maybe that's why he becomes the way he becomes. He just didn't have a father to tell him how to behave, etc. Um, so we read literature for entertainment and to gain perspective. I could bring in half dozen novels, half dozen different authors, half dozen different continents. Okay. Half dozen different time periods. In each one of those, we could learn something about what's called the human condition. Why? Because it doesn't really change all that much. From 2,500 years ago, the earliest literature of ancient Greece, to today. Because what are we still, you know, faced with today? Problems that, that people were faced with then. One of the great, great tragedies is called Antigone. And it's about a girl who disobeys her uncle, who happens to be the king. She breaks the law, and he wants to throw the power of the state down against her. It's all about personal conscience versus the law of the state. 
How many of you have broken the law before? How many of you have broken the law intentionally for a moral reason? That is, not just, well, this stupid speed limit, that's wrong. That's not a moral reason. But you said, I'm not going to listen to this. I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to follow this. Maybe it's not the law, per se. Maybe it's, a, I don't know, MTSU rule or something. Okay? You probably have at some point. Well, that's the same issue that confronted Antigone a long time ago. Okay? Now, let me get back to this. Because you mentioned the imagination. And Predane exists where? Here. But it only exists here after what? After you read it. J.R.R. Tolkien, in this essay on fairy stories, that he delivered in 1939 to St. Andrews University, um, pretty long essay, talks about what fairy stories are, what their origins are, and what their purposes or functions or uses are now. In fact, the way he begins it is he says, you know, I'm going to talk to you about fairy stories. He says, I'm not a scholar of fairy stories. And he wasn't. He says, but I love them. So that's why I'm going to talk to you. He wasn't their first choice, by the way. He was the third choice to deliver this essay, this lecture. This lecture had been going on every year for, I don't know, 20 or 30 years at least. Okay? Andrew Lang lecture. But they invite Tolkien to do it because, this is 1939, in 1937, Tolkien published a novel. Anybody know what it was? The Hobbit. He published The Hobbit. Okay? About short, fat, little Bilbo Baggins. Okay? Becomes an international bestseller. Tolkien is your quintessential, pointy-headed, socially awkward, English don. Professor of Anglo-Saxon. I mean, he doesn't even teach anything relevant. He teaches old English literature, the kind of stuff I love. Okay? And Beowulf. He studies Beowulf. In and out. Well, because he writes what is kind of hailed as a modern classic fairy tale, an overnight classic, which is a contradiction in terms, because traditionally it can't be a classic until it's past the test of time. Overnight is not the test of time. Witness one night stands. Do you love me? Yes, for the next five hours. Um, <laughs> that's not classic. So he gives this essay, and he says, "So I'm going to talk to you, and I'm not a scholar, so I guess I should talk to you about something." So here's these three questions. You probably want to know the answers to, since it's a lecture on fairy stories. What are fairy stories? That's one question. What are the origins of fairy stories? Where did they come from? That's probably another question you want to answer to. Third one, what are their uses now? Now that's kind of an interesting question because he's talking about story, literature, as having a use. At the university today, and I've got a big old thing in my, in my bag, I just printed it out before class. We're going through a process of redefining, redesigning the core program, the gen ed program. Why? Because it's not that now the gen ed program doesn't make any sense. Because you take an English course here, you take a history course here, you take a biology course here, you take a philosophy course here, you take a science course here, you take another humanities course or two here, and they're not connected. And they have nothing to do with your major. And it's not, they're all irrelevant. They have nothing to do with life. <laughs> really? I mean, really? How much does philosophy have to do with life? This is the argument, okay? I could argue why every one of them has an awful lot of relevance. But the central argument becomes relevance. Is it relevant? Well, does it have to be? Does what you read have to be relevant to your personal situation in order for you to benefit from it? Okay? Yeah. Or you could find a new hobby or passion if you read through 
great career. Sure thing. Also, what I mean, it's harder for a tyrannical government to overthrow a people, or you know what I mean, take over people if they're well rounded and educated. That's not what I usually hear, but th that's true, right? But you used another phrase that I'm very glad you used because it's one I've not heard come from a student's lips in decades. Well-rounded. The purpose of the university used to be to produce a well-round, doesn't mean fat, <laughs> a well-rounded citizen. So what does well-rounded mean? Somebody who is knowledgeable in a wide variety of areas, or somebody who has been introduced to ideas in a wide variety of areas. Why is it important to be introduced to those ideas? Because those ideas will sit in the back of your mind, and depending on the metaphor you want to use, they will either kind of percolate, like water through stone, or they will infect, like a virus, your body. And what will they do? They'll stick around with you. So that years later, possibly, you might remember something you were in the class and you decide to do a little reading about it and you get passionately interested, etc. What else? Why else take a wide variety of courses early on? Did you know that the average, and this, is, this holds true for like the last 30 or 40 years, the average student changes majors, excuse me, changes careers, seven times in their lifetime. That is, you might be a recording industry major, and you might graduate with, graduate with a recording industry you know, degree, and you might get a job, I don't know, Music Row or something, or BMG or Sony, or you might go out to Hollywood, LA, et cetera. But the odds are, you will not be in the same career for the next 40 years of your life. The odds are, you will change careers. Careers, not job positions. Careers, seven times. So should the university prepare you for one job? If it does, it's not a university. It's a vocational school for that particular vocation. Okay? Back to this little rant over. So... <laughs> Tolkien essentially says, what are fairy stories? I don't know. He says they can't be defined. Literally. If you understand what that word define means. What does it mean? Definition. definition. What does the word definition mean? An explanation of something. Okay, it's a little bit more than that. That's close. What do you do when you define something? Bingo. You limit it. You de-infinite it. You make it so it's no longer infinite. Right? You put a border around it. Tolkien says you can't do that with fairy stories. The best you can say is, I know one when I see one. Or hear one. But you can't say all stories like X are fairy stories. Or all stories like why are not fairy stories. There can be stories that you might not think are fairy stories, and guess what? They are fairy stories. Someone name a modern film that's a fairy story. The Notebook. I've never seen it. The Notebook, though. <laughs> okay? Give me another one. I've mentioned one already. Star Wars. Star Wars is not science fiction. Star Wars is fairy story all throughout. Star Trek is science fiction. How do you know Star Wars is fairy story? You get this? Yes. Because it's space wizards. Okay, it's space wizards. <laughs> okay, what else? What else? It can't all be explained by science. It can't all be explained by science. You get this great scene in the first film. The real first film. Yeah, Episode like 6 in New Hope. Okay. Where Luke is learning how to use the Force. And he's got on the shield that covers his eyes, and Obi-Wan sitting over there directing him, telling him, use the Force field. 
use the force of Luke. Reach out for it. Let it flow within you. Blah, 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 blah. And Han Solo's sitting over there, fingering his blaster. And he says, hokey religion and old weapons are no match for a good blaster. Jump to the end of the movie. I mean, you can literally skip everything else in between. And what do we see? A blaster what? Without the hokey religion, did nothing. Because he's got all the computer gadgets, right? He's looking through his sighting thing, and he hears Obi-Wan's disembodied voice, you know, trust in the force, Luke, trust. And he turns it off, and they're like, uh, Luke, Luke, turn the plastic thing back on. You can't see it. You're going to miss. We're all going to die. It's like Stevie Wonder, you know, at a range, and you're all standing out there. I believe he won't hit me, you know. Uh, that's pure fantasy, okay? So, Tolkien says, what are they? I can't tell you what they are, but I can tell you one when I recognize one. And he takes a long time to do that, okay? I just did it much quicker. That second question, what are their origins? That's another one. We're, ultimately, he says, what are their origins? Their origins are in human thought. So when did thought begin? Uh, you can't answer that one, right? He says, the origins of story, mythology, are bound up with thought. Because at some point in time, somebody came up with the idea green. Why? Look out the window. There's all kinds of green. So they separated greenness from plants and stuff to the idea of green. And Tolkien says, and he applies it to a person. Men, green people? I mean, literally. No, but now you have somebody who's green. And he said the same kind of individual thought of an instance where you can make gold light so it floats. Kind of like when Guardium Leviosa. Okay. That's fairy story, Tolkien says. We're no longer where? We're no longer in Kansas, right? We in Toto, we've gone off to Oz, okay? But part of what he says in that section on what are their origins are, in really, ultimately, does it matter? For example, I told you what the etymology is of Darth Vader. Darth comes from the word Darth. Dirt, okay? Vader is Dutch. It's cool, right? To know that it means black father. Does it really add a lot to our understanding of Darth Vader? No, it doesn't. Okay. What about something like the Lord of the Rings? What's the source? What are the origins of the Lord of the Rings? <laughs> there aren't, there isn't one. Let me put it that way. What's the origin of Gandalf? There is a document written in Old Norse, language of the Vikings. And it, that document has a list of dwarves' names. Dwarves, dwarves. You know. One of them, his name is Gandalf. Think of it, right? right? A bunch of the other dwarves from The Hobbit are also in that document. Okay, so Tolkien knew this thing. Why? Because Tolkien knew everything that related <laughs> to Germanic languages. He was able to speak like 14, and I think he could, re he could read like 20 languages. He started learning Greek and Latin when he was about six years old. He knew Gothic by the time he was 15 or 16. Taught himself. Gothic, the oldest surviving form of the Germanic languages. Okay? So he, he was pretty good when it came to languages and stuff. So he read a lot. He also read Finnish stuff. And you've got all these elements of Germanic... Celtic, 
Finnish, a little bit of Russian possibly, maybe some Sanskrit, ancient Hindu, things that show up in the whole world of Middle Earth. Does that mean that if you pull those things out, you can go, oh, this is what it means? Nope. Why? Because Tolkien uses the metaphor of soup. How do you make soup or stew? Yeah, with all the ingredients in. Bingo. You have a pot, right? What comes next? Underneath the pot, fire. Some water in the pot. And then everything over here, all the ingredients. So if I tell you next week, don't eat dinner or anything, come to class and, and I'll have stew prepared for you. And you come in and I have a pot and I have a big jug of water and I have a hot pot, a thing to cook it on. And I have some onions and some carrots and some potatoes, maybe some celery, salt and pepper, some other spices and stuff, a big chunk of meat, and maybe some other things all over here. And I say, dig in. Enjoy your stew. I've got a, what do you mean i got to make the stew? Like, those are all ingredients in type stew. It's not those are the origins of stew. They're not stew itself. He says, asking, what are the origins of fairy stories? Asking for the ingredients of stew. You take a bite into that onion. Mmm. Not quite the same is taking a bite of the stew, right? So you pull all the elements out, and what do you end up with? A concoction of different things. You end up with the ingredients. You don't end up with the story. The story is what? The story is all the ingredients in the pot that have been doing what? Some of them, some stories, were literally thousands of years, or some elements of story. For example, I don't I don't wear mine anymore because they, they don't fit my fingers. What's the key thing in the Lord of the Rings? The ring. The rings. Right? Is Tolkien the first one to come up with an I something that makes you invisible? Nope. Is he the first one to come up with a ring that makes you invisible? Nope. It shows up in old Germanic stuff. Harry Potter is what that makes him invisible? A cloak. A cloak. Okay. So, is it important that it's a ring or a cloak? What's important? And Tolkien asks, somewhere in that, what he calls, cauldron of story, that idea of invisibility gets mixed in. Why? We don't know why, and we can't answer why. All we can say is that sometime, hell of a long time ago, Somebody thought it'd be really cool to be invisible. <laughs> and now we all kind of think it'd be really cool to be invisible. Similarly, what else shows up in the cauldron of story that J.K. Rowling pulls out in the first novel that every one of us have probably had dreams about? Same book. Have you had dreams about the Sorcerer's Stone or the Philosopher's Stone? Okay. What else, though? Even more basic than that in one sense. What does Madam Hooch teach them? Flying. Have none of you ever had a dream about flying? Not in an airplane. Just flying. On your own. Superman style. See, most people have. It's a very common dream. Has Harry flown before that moment when he first jumps on the broom? Because he discovers he can what? Oh, he's good. He's really good. He's a natural. See, that kind of fulfills this basic human desire to be able to fly or do things you can't naturally do on your own. All right? What else? Tolkien creates a character named... Treebeard. What is he? He's a talking tree. I'm from California. Right? I used to go backpacking Sierra Nevada Mountains, Santa Cruz Mountains. Santa Cruz Mountains have a couple of stands of giant sequoias. 
You've never seen a giant sequoia tree, a giant redwood tree. You haven't seen a tree, a real tree, a tree that is in diameter as wide as this room. Diameter. Right? You see that tree and you kind of almost want to fall down and be like, oh, yes, master. Because <laughs> you look up and you can't see the top of the blasted thing. Some of them have been around for two thousand years. Wouldn't it be nice to go? Okay, tell me. <laughs> How many of you have a pet? Show of hands. Dogs? Some of you. Cats? I'm sorry. <laughs> Got two. They hate me. <laughs> One was just an orange pest. Referring to the, the wretched one. Okay. <laughs> but I've got a 14 year old Labrador that's on his last months. I would love, you're going to love this name, I would love to be able to have Remus, <laughs> yes, Harry Potter, the other two dogs are Padfoot and Prongs. I would love to be able to have Remus talk. Why? Because I think a dog's perspective would be pretty cool. Cats, cats don't give a damn. <laughs> cat, you know, you try to try. The cat would probably flip you off and you know raise its tail at you and you know, right? That's another thing Tolkien says we have a human need for. That is to communicate with something different than us. Some have argued that's what lies behind the desire for extraterrestrials to be real. To know that what we're not alone. If you think about the expansion, the expansiveness of the universe, and if what we now know is true, and that's what we now know is we're it, you're pretty small. <laughs> and, okay? I mean, that's, hello, anybody out there? Okay? So, he does away with the origins of stories by essentially saying, knowing the origins doesn't really help us understand the story any better. So he asks the question, what are the functions of stories or fairy stories? What are their uses and functions now? Because we have some stories that go back several hundred years. That is, we can read the old English poem Beowulf. All right? And one of the things you ought to do when you read the Old English poem, Beowulf, is try to figure out what it meant then. I'm teaching, of course, the Bible's Bible and literature. I'm teaching kind of the Bible as literature. One of the things we do there is, what did the Bible, or the chapters, the books that we'll be reading, mean when they were written? And what do they mean now? How do we read them, understand them now? Well, the same thing applies to stories. What did Snow White or Cinderella mean when the story was first created, it's kind of hard to answer because we don't know exactly when they were first created. We know that they go back to at least 1500. Okay, and what do they mean now? So Tolkien says that's what we need to do with with fairy stories. And then he talks about children, because probably if you came in and you saw these words on the wall, one of the ideas that might have come into your mind was, wait, is is this fantasy literature? Because I don't want to mess up fairy stories. Because fairy stories are what? They're for children. Are they? Um, when I was working on my doctorate, my wife was pregnant with her first child, totally unplanned, totally, you know. And I was, you know, I went to the uh, health center on campus because I was sick or something. And I was sitting there in the waiting room, and because she was pregnant, I brought a big, thick, you know, the complete A.A. A. Milne Winnie the Pooh. I thought, I'm going to start reading Winnie the Pooh, so that when our child was born, I could start reading, even young, Winnie the Pooh. Because I knew enough at that point, you know, even in the womb, kids can under, you know, amazing things. Understands. And so I go, you know, into the exam room with the doctor. She's nice, she's young, and she goes, oh, reading Winnie the Pooh, you know. Because you're like a 31 year old white man. <laughs> What's going on with you, buddy? And I immediately were like, oh, well, you know, I'm not reading it for myself. No, no, it's just for my 
kid, etc. Well, I was also reading it for myself because I hadn't read Winnie the Pooh Poo in 25 years, probably. Well, Tolkien says that's because adults are ashamed to be seen reading quote unquote fairy tales. When I taught my first Harry Potter course in London, 2003, um, only four of the books were out then. Right? Five, seven, yeah. Five of the books were out then. And it's kind of interesting because I'd get on the tube, London Underground. I'd get on the tube, and when the book, um, I mean, it's 2005. In 2005, when the sixth book was published, uh, Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince, I'd get on the tube, and I'd see all kinds of adults. And they'd be on the tube, too, or on a bus, and they'd have a newspaper open like this. And it would be clear they weren't reading the newspaper. And most of the time I could see they had hidden in the newspaper the Harry Potter novel. But they didn't want to be seen reading that. These are like lawyers, doctors, people of importance. In fact, it, it actually, um, in Britain, the publisher got really smart. And the publisher printed the Harry Potter novels, each one when it first came out, after about the third one, beginning, I think, with the fourth. They printed it in two different covers. One cover, very bright, very colorful. That was the one for kids. The other cover, almost nondescript. That is, almost nothing on the cover. Just dark. You open it up and it says Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire. Kind of thing. That's the adult version, so that you could be reading it and people knows it, know that you're reading it. Kind of thing. Right? What's the point of all this? In the essay on fairy stories, which I did post to D2L today, Tolkien says fairy stories are written for us. It's only an accident of history that they've been regarded as being for children. And then accident of history is, if you have multiple kids, Tolkien had four children, I've got four children, and you have furniture in your house that gets used, that goes bad, what sometimes do you do with that furniture, rather than today, put it on Craigslist or Facebook Marketplace or something like that? Such as, bear in mind you're thinking of children, you put it in the playroom, or their bedroom, or a bonus room, or something. Why? Because it doesn't matter what they do with it. It could be a castle to them. It could be a castle. It could also be something to bounce on. Because it's not the kind of furniture you're going to leave in the living room for your guests and friends to you know, sit on. So you don't really care. And in the 19th century, Tolkien argues, and he argues fairly well, that there were certain kinds of literature that because the adults didn't know what to do with, they relegated it to children. That literature was fairy tales. Why? Well, part of the 19th century, beginning earlier in the 18th century, you have what occurs. Well, the Industrial Revolution, partly, but that's not really apropos to the point. You've got the age of reason now. Develop. So, we adults, we kind of start to develop this attitude of, Fairy tales are written for me. If I'm going to read imaginative literature, it ought to be serious imaginative literature, not collections of fairy tales or fairy songs or things like that. It should be what? Pick up any Dickens novel. They're almost all unbearably long and boring, in my opinion. I love a Christmas Carol, but it's short really short, and it's total fantasy, okay? Tolkien says the fairy stories get shunted off, shunted off to the children. Do children need fairy stories? Generally. Define children 5 to, let's say, 12 years old. What, what are, you tell me, what's a quality? 
person who fell out of the sense of imagination. Okay, so what's a quality, a quality of a fairy story? Imagination. Or it's imaginary. What's another one? What can it produce in a child? Happiness. Happiness. What else? Sense of wonder. Just leave, just use these three for a moment. Now, in the Western developed industrialized world, for the most part, notice all qualifications. Do most kids need help with these things? Do most kids need help developing an imagination? Hell no. Happiness, okay, maybe they come from a broken family. Maybe their father's a piece of it. Yeah, they might need some happiness. But generally speaking, the vast majority of kids are happy, generally speaking. Wonder? No. They see a rainbow, what happens? Man, their eyes pop out of their head. <laughs> you go for a walk with a five-year-old kid. You're walking down a trail. They see a bottle cap. Ooh, this is totally cool. They want to pick it up. You're going Put it down, it's a piece of trash, you know. Or they see something else. Look at this cool rock. It's a rock. You don't know where that rock's been. Don't touch it, put it. They see a mud puddle. What do they want to do? Jump in it. Oh, man. Not just jump in it. Roll in it. Be like a pig. Okay? <laughs> it's dirty. It's get out. You know. Okay? They don't need this. Many little kids, not all. Many little kids have imaginary friends that they talk to. All right? Do they really need something to help bolster their imagination? Not really. Tolkien says, however, we do. And he compares kind of adults with Peter Pan's. How many of you know the story of Peter Pan? Does Peter Pan belong in Neverland? Belong. No, he doesn't. So why does he stay? He doesn't want to grow up. Why doesn't he want to grow up? Because adults are boring. Why else? What do adults have that children in Neverland, the lost boys, don't have? Jobs, responsibility, life. Louder? Oh, rules, <clears throat> the weight. Okay. Two really good versions. Hook with Robin Williams and the later one with Jason Isaacs who played Lucius Malfoy in the Harry Potter films as um, the father of the children. It's a fan I can't remember the title. It might just be Peter Pan. It's fantastic. Look it up. There's this one line line in the latter one with Jason Isaacs. You know, as a father, it's just, you know, it's like a stab in the heart. Um, but Peter, but the hook version with Robin Williams. Remember the premise of the story? He's forgotten who he is. He's now a merger and acquisitions lawyer, specialist, who slices and dices companies, throws people out of their jobs and livelihood, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Well, he goes back accidentally to Neverland. And all the lost boys see him, but they don't know it's him. And what happens? One little boy comes up to him, and this is Robin Williams. There's only Robin Williams now. Can do, could do. And this one little kid comes up to him, and he takes his hand and puts him on his face like this, and he does this and pushes his face way back. And he says, there you are, Peter. Where? It's in his eyes. It's not in anything else. Well, what does Peter Banning, his name, have to do? He has to rediscover the wonder and all that kind of stuff. He has to go back. He has to do what Tolkien says, fairy stories offer all of us. Right? He says fairy stories, these are the uses and functions now. Now. 2019, when he first delivers this, 1939, when he first publishes it in 1946, when he publishes it again in a revised version in 1965, each moment, or whenever you read it. The purpose of 
fairy stories for us adults now is fourfold. It offers us these four things. Fantasy. Why do we need fantasy? I mean, sheesh, we can get on these things, right? All your fantasy is fulfilled. Two ninety nine an hour. <laughs> <laughs> and what does he mean by fantasy? He calls it first and foremost something. Arresting strangeness. Arresting. What does it mean? To be arrested. I don't mean a cop. To be arrested means to be stopped. So strangeness that stops you in your tracks. If any of you ever experienced anything like that? I mean real strangeness that kind of, you know, and you're frozen for a moment? I have. 2009. Good Friday. Murfreesboro. Anybody know where I'm going with that? The tornado, the F4 tornado came through town. I was getting ready to go to a massage appointment or something, turning off my street, left on the Highway 96, and there's all these cars and they're all pulling right. I knew there were there was bad weather going on. I've been listening to the radio. There were thunderstorms and everything. Weren't any tornadoes mentioned, and all these cars are pulling to the right. And I turn to look at the right, and there, not 200 yards away from me, is this big black V. Yeah, that's arresting strangeness. I was kind of frozen in my tracks. Why? Because it was coming right at me. Threw my car in reverse, backed up 200 yards to my house, literally. Didn't turn around, just, you know. My kids were home. I got them under the stairs, and being the damn fool I am, I went out on the front porch. Because <laughs> I wanted to watch this. I'm from California. I'd never seen a tornado before. Earthquakes? Yeah, you don't worry about them. You rock and roll. <laughs> Tornadoes? <laughs> And when I saw all the debris, I was like, okay, duck inside the door and still look. You know. <laughs> Arrest me strangers. Yes. What is number two saying? Recovery. We'll get to it in just a second. So, arrest me strangers. None of you are old enough, I don't think, to remember spring 1977. <laughs> when a movie came out. Two, actually. Two movies came out. One came out before the other. Close Encounters of the Third Kind came out by Steven Spielberg. And Star Wars came out by George Lucas. Spielberg's was good. It was great, in fact. And it had some arresting strangeness, but it wasn't like the beginning of Star Wars. Nobody had ever done anything like that. Where you go, you stand there, and it was brand new Dolby sound. It had never been used before. It was kind of invented for, you know. And you get the blaring music. You got John Williams' great score. And these words start to crawl up the screen and disappear. That in and of itself told you, this is not a normal movie. Words? Really? How boring. Is it all going to be like this? So those go up and go that way. And then what happens? From the top upper right hand corner comes down big giant star destroyer not pristine white like it just come off the assembly line like stanley kubrick's space station and space vehicles were in 2001 a space odyssey in 1968. this one proverbially had been around the block a few times and its warranty was expired there's blast marks on it okay and then, you know, you're immediately in the whole thing. But once you see it, you immediately realize, oh, it's a Western set in space. Good guys, bad guys, bad guys were black, good guys were white. Well, most of them, except for the stormtroopers, you know, and other things. So it starts with that arresting strangers, okay? What else? It's got other elements to it. Part of those other elements is that Tolkien says that the, one of the things that fantasy is all about is shared enrichment. And he distinguishes this with this. He 
talked about magic. And he says, magic is the desire or the domination. I mentioned this, I think in my other class, I'm sorry. Mention, um, it's the domination of wills and things. That's the desire of the magician, right? Because what's a magician do? Assume for the moment, magic is real. Real, real, not sleight of hand, not, you know, misdirection, but when Guardian Leviosa and Imperio crack like a duck and, you know, the whole nine yards. Imagine how much fun that could be, okay? That's magic. Domination of wills and things. Which, according to Tolkien, is always bad. Always bad. Versus shared enrichment. Shared enrichment's like, come here, you gotta see this. You have to experience this. Or it might be, try this, man. <laughs> shared enrichment. <laughs> For some, okay, I'm from California, okay? So <laughs> I remember the 70s. <laughs> um, shared enrichment is designed to do what? Expand the mind. Not drugs expand the mind, but expand the mind like the imagination. Does. What does the imagination do? It creates a spot in your mind where we can go in the land of Credane. Shared enrichment is, I've had this experience. I want you to have it too. I want your eyes to be open to this. Have you ever gone outside and seen a sunset and run back inside and gotten somebody and said, look at this. Sky looks like it's on fire. That's shared enrichment. That's part of this. Why? It doesn't happen all the time. Okay? Well, what comes after that? Time, 755. Recovery. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's in that order. So what's recovery? Why do adults need recovery? Not we're not talking AA. But in, in a sense, it's kind of, you know, recovery. Recovery of what? Recovery of clear vision. Tolkien says none of us see it. We all see poorly. We need to have our glasses clean. How do you do that? Well, this is what fairy stories, Tolkien says, are designed to do for adults. Part of that is through this. They enable us to see with eyes of wonder again. How so? Because in that fairy story, we experience things that kind of make us go, oh, or, oh. Star Wars. What happened right after Obi-Wan Kenobi told Darth Vader, if you strike me down, I'll be more powerful than even you can imagine. Or something to that effect. Oh, yeah. Oh, man. You know. Oh, look. You're a rogue. What's the problem there for Darth Vader? Uh, that was a cool trick. Where are you? I'm here, Darth. You know, he could do, okay. Wonder, right? Huge wonder. What else? Think of uh, Revenge of the Jedi. Luke's up on the spaceship. He's with Darth Vader. They're watching the attack, and Darth Vader says, oh, by the way, we know about your little friends down there on the moon. On the moon. You know, they're all going to die. And Luke tells him, Father, there is good in you. I can feel it. I can sense it. Anybody know what Darth Vader says? Does he say, you're full of it, kid. There's no good left in me. I'm rotten. I'm thoroughly evil. And I like it. <laughs> like some of Shakespeare's great villains do. I mean, they're just like, <laughs> no. no, he doesn't. What does he do? He tells us something which is a form of telegraphing to us or foreshadowing to us. Hmm. Maybe even someone like Darth Vader can change. He says, not 
there's not any good. He says, it's too late for you. By the very fact of saying, it's too late for me, Luke knows, if you can say, it's too late for me, it's not too late. When is it too late? <laughs> right? So that when he has his battle with the emperor, Luke goes what? Father, help me. You know, the emperor. And what do we see? We see the inner struggle in Darth Vader. He looks at his son, being tortured, and he looks at his master. And then big plot hole. Huge plot hole, I think, in the film. He picks up the emperor and throws him down the tube thing. Okay, if the emperor is more or less all powerful, and the emperor is the greatest, you know, quote unquote Jedi living up essentially at that point, why doesn't the emperor just do the stupid little trick like Luke does earlier and psh, pop right back out of the hole? What gives? I'm serious. I mean, this is a huge plot, plot hole. Okay? So, recovery is that it. Where's Darth Vader's recovery? Luke kills the emperor. Darth Vader kills the emperor. And in the process, Darth Vader is damaged. And what does Luke do? He pulls off Darth Vader's mask. Why? Because Vader says, I want to look at you through my own eyes. That is, not as Darth Vader. When did Darth Vader become Darth Vader? When he stopped being Anakin. Which happened when? True. When he puts on the mask. When he puts on the mask and he puts on the whole cloak and everything in one of those god awful middle films, you know, that's when he becomes Darth Vader. He takes the mask off and he no longer goes, <coughs> he breathes like you and I do, but not as long. <laughs> Question? Oh, no. I was just. I just thought, like, maybe um, the reason he didn't recover from the fall, maybe he was so shocked by Vader's betrayal. And they, 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 yep. didn't, record, like, they didn't telegraph that right to the audience. Could be. Seems to me if you're a master evil villain, you know, you kind of thought through things like that. How come? Luke? He wasn't. He's trying to save his father. That's why when he said, come with me. Turn. There is, he says, there is still good in you. What does he mean by that? Yeah, you got the whole black outfit and everything and the spooky breathing, you know, and all that. You're not so bad as everybody thinks you are. In other words, Luke is essentially saying what Christianity essentially teaches. And the Lord of the Rings is full of Christian ideas. It's also full of a lot of Buddhist ideas and a lot of Hindu ideas. George, um, Lucas kind of goes to the religious smorgasbord and says, well, I believe in this, I believe in this, I believe in this, and I'll mix them all up in that cauldron of story, and voila. Okay? It's one of the reasons the film resonates so much. So many people go to it and they go, wow, that's really deep, because that's part of my belief system, or something like that. But part of that is no one, no one, no one, get the emphasis? is entirely evil. Now, who does no one include? For some of you, it might be Donald Trump. For some of you, hopefully, most of us would say, okay, maybe not entirely, but mostly, you know, Hitler. After all, if we don't like somebody, who do we see, in our politics at least, who do we compare those that we don't like to? It seems like everybody in the media Hitler. You have a disagreement. Someone took your parking spot. He's Hitler. You know? It's ridiculous. Okay. Stalin? Stalin was loads worse than Hitler. If you want to count the numbers of dead. Hitler's responsible for 6 million Jews, gays, Christians, gypsies. <laughs> Gypsies, I mean, what did they ever do against them? You know, and a few others. Stalin, conservative estimate, 20 million. Non conservative estimate, 
60 million dead at his hands. Paul Pot, Che Guevara, I know it's not, you know, cool to mention Che Guevara, a lot of college students think, oh, he's cool, he's got the nice parade, and, you know, freedom. And the guy was a murdering thug. You see the guy with the stickers outside of see everywhere? There's his face. Yeah, he's got the beard and the black like hair and the little beret, you know. He's a, yeah, he was a doctor, but he was a murderous thug responsible for the death of millions, you know. Castro, et cetera, et cetera. Mao. I mean, we could probably even throw Xi, the current leader of China. Because he's got over a million Muslims <coughs> in concentration concentration camps. Not the kind of camps we have on the southern border that the idiot from New York wants to compare with death camps. Real concentration camps. He's put over a million Muslims in, in China. We know about it. Everybody knows about it. But they're not going to do anything. Why? He's powerful. He's powerful. China's got nukes. When, once somebody gets nukes, it's okay, so what are you going to do? Come on. <laughs> what are you going to do about it? Is that, just <laughs> that kind of <laughs> creates a little problem. Yeah. You know? That's so, fire, fire. Yeah. Big, big fire. fire. Big fire. So... <laughs> Tolkien talks about recovery. So why do we need recovery? We need recovery so that we can see clearly. See what clearly? Louder? Life. Life. Everything. In the specific example he uses, is he talks about our familiars. Those people we see day in and day out. That he says we don't tend to see correctly. But what's he mean we don't see them correctly? Any of you in here have a significant other? Show of hands. Come on, put them up. Be proud. Yeah. Some of you do. The rest of you are loners and losers. Okay. Um, some of us are married, maybe. Okay. Any of you have a brother, a sister, a parent? Okay. All of you have something. Okay. Hopefully, you love that person. I don't know. Maybe you're just a... Person is going to come back one day with a gun and kill them. Because <laughs> if you if you don't have anybody that you love, you're pro there's something weird going on. You're a psychopath. Yeah, let's not go there. Okay, so you have people you love. Tolkien says those are our familiars, but here's the problem: what do we often tend to do with those who are closest to us? How so? Like intentionally? No, like, you know, you're typically, like, more polite to people you don't know than when you see someone who's just, like, common. So what do you do with those that you see all the time? You take them for granted. What does that mean? To take somebody for granted means you take them as kind of a base postulate. They're always there. They're like the air you breathe. Is the air going to be gone tomorrow? No, of course not. Is the proof? Well, even scientifically, it can't be gone tomorrow because if the sun blows up tonight, there won't be a tomorrow. <laughs> okay? So, we think they're going to be there all the time. Crazy person, AK-40. They're not always, right? 9-11, there are thousands of people who got up that morning and probably some of them had arguments with the people they love. And they went off to work, they went off to school, and they never saw those people they love again. And the last words ringing in the ears of those who died were the arguments. That's why we need recovery, because we take people for granted. Tolkien uses the image of you know, what we tend to do is we take that person and we do what? Put them in our wallet. Where they're safe, so to speak. My wife and I have been married in May. It'll be 35 years. 34 years. The idea is. Or 33 maybe. I put her in my wallet. Why? Control, you know, a white patriarchal male. No. Nah. Because it's easier that way, and because I know where she is, you know, all, all that kind of stuff. 
Well, what does that mean? I don't do. And she'd be the if I brought her in here, she'd be the first one to tell you. You know, when we were dating, because I'm a romantic kind of guy, I'd send cards, I'd get flowers, I I mean the whole nine yards. I went the whole. I kept it up for a few years after we got married. Now, no, she doesn't get a card every week. She's lucky to get a card on her birthday. <laughs> Flowers, maybe once a month. Delivered, hell no, it's too expensive, and I'm a cheap bastard. You know? I'll get some from Publix, and here, honey, you put it in the basin. <laughs> hey, it's an attempt, okay? Tolkien's point is, we take that person, and that person becomes what? To our life, a decoration, an ornament. What do you do with decorations or ornaments? What do you do if you win a trophy? Or let's be even more stupid. You play a sport and you're a little kid. You get a participation award or trophy. And you play enough sports and stuff and you get a whole wall full of them. And if your mom's really psycho, she puts them all up. Okay? So you have all your participation awards and trophies. I was a youth soccer coach, okay? I hated it. Absolutely hated giving out, you know, participation trophies. You know, we lose a game six nothing. Yeah, do we get a trophy? No, you get a trophy, you're a loser. No. <laughs> okay? Teach them morals. Teach them morals. But Tolkien says that's what we do with those we love. We put them on the mantle and don't pay any attention. And what recovery does is it enables us, with this example, to see that person how? Okay, how else? Because I haven't talked about seeing flaws. Seeing an individual like when we first saw him or her. I'm one of those weirdos. When I first met my wife, I thought, I'm going to marry her. She didn't. <laughs> <laughs> we dated for a while. She broke up with me. You know, it was like the country, typical country song. You know, when you stab that heart. You know. And then I ignored her for like nine months. And yeah, then she came around back. <laughs> we ignore them. Why? They're always there. Well, what else do we ignore? About life. About the world we see around us. Okay, what else? Everything. When was the last time, Tolkien essentially asked, when was the last time you really looked at a tree? Tolkien loves trees. He is, he is the quintessential tree hugger environmentalist man. Okay. When was the last time you really, really looked at a tree? Went up, felt the texture of a tree. Looked at its leaves and all that, especially with fall coming. And there are some beautiful trees on campus. Unfortunately, we seem to be cutting most of them down. You know? Here's an old redbud used to be up in front of Peck Hall. Cut it down. Why? So we can widen the sidewalk. Okay? Um, or when was the last time you really looked at a flower? Really looked at it closer so that you could see the veins on the petals? When was the last time, I don't know, it's a stupid analogy, but I'm going to use it. When was the last time you really looked at a classroom at Pet Call? I don't, God forbid, it'd almost be better to be blind, you know. <laughs> Most of us, we don't. We come in and we do what? Find an empty chair, sit down, and wait for this god-awful lecture to finally end so I can go off, you know, and do something fun. Like, I don't know, kill myself. <laughs> <laughs> For, for some for some of you, this might just be worse than hell. Okay? <laughs> but with recovery, part of what Tolkien says, what it enables us to do, is you come in a room like this, and what do you see? Other people, right? What else? Walls. What are the walls made of? Because this room's different than a lot of the other ones. It's not concrete block. It's got this foamy stuff on it. It's like, you know, rubber room. <laughs> and I have most of my classes in here. I think they're trying to tell me something. Okay. Rubber room. And if you look real closely, especially if you come over here, man. It does. 
every time that screen comes down, more stuff comes down. <laughs> Ceiling, tiles, holes in them. I had classes when I was in college that were so god awful boring. I literally sat there and tried to count the holes <laughs> in some of those tiles. I mean, really bad. Okay. You've done that before. Okay. <laughs> Speakers. Why? Because of this thing. Okay. You can go into other classrooms and notice there's differences in all of them. Yeah, they're generally the same. The floor in here is different. It's this fake wood. All right. Recovery allows us to see, Tolkien says, or enables, enables us to see as we are meant to see. What does he mean as we are meant to see? To see everything through eyes of wonder. To see everything like that five-year-old I talked about who picked up a rock. Because for that five-year-old, that rock has a totally cool name. It might just be a rock, but it's a totally cool rock. And for that five-year-old, what can anything become? <laughs> That's recovery. But how do they do that? How many of you have read The Lord of the Rings? Anybody? A few of you. How many have seen the films? I'm sorry. Uh, only a few of you have read Harry Potter, right? How many of you read Harry Potter? Okay, I'm going to use something. And if you're planning on reading Harry Potter, sorry, I'm going to give something away. But it's something that's really important for this idea of, of recovery. From books one through six, for those of you who have read Harry Potter, or if you've seen the films, because it still comes out at least in the first six films, describe Harry's relationship with his wonderful cousin Dudley. They hate each other. Why? Dudley's a bully. He's a big, fat slob the first several books of a bully and then he becomes a big ripped Chris Hemsworth like bully boxing champion of Southeast England okay so they hate each other they can't stand being in each other's presence until something happens in the sixth book Harry saves Dudley's life Dudley's not really quite aware, because Dudley's not quite sure what happened. And then the seventh book begins. And the seventh book begins, Harry's getting ready to leave the house forever, never coming back. And the Dursleys are getting ready to leave. And he steps outside his bedroom door, and there's a teacup with cold tea that he accidentally breaks. And he thinks it's just, a, you know, another bad practical joke by Dudley. So they get ready to leave. And Dudley asks, because the Dursleys are leaving before Harry is, because all hell's about to break loose. Harry's now turned into an adult. So Lord Voldemort's going to come after him. And so they're getting the Dursleys out of there. Why? Because Harry loves the Dursleys so much. Not. He doesn't want anything bad to happen. He doesn't love them. He doesn't want anything bad to happen. So they're getting ready to leave, and Dudley goes, what about him? Talk about Harry. Dudley's father says, what about him? Well, what's he going to do? He's staying with them. And Dudley's like, why? Well, you know why, because we got to go. And Harry makes the comment to one of the wizards that's there to help him. He makes the comment, you know, they think I'm a waste of space. They, my only living relative, think I'm a waste of space. And they're like, damn, that's me. It's pretty bad to have lived here in the last seven years of your life. Six years of your life. That's six, excuse me, 16 years of your life. So, a voice says, I don't think you're a waste of space. And Harry looks, and it's Dudley. He's like, if he hadn't seen Dudley's lips move, he wouldn't have thought it was Dudley speaking. And Aunt Petunia's crying because of what Dudley says. And Harry's like, what? I don't think you're a waste of space. 
And Aunt Petunia interprets that. And one of the other ladies says, that's not what he said. And Harry says, yes, but coming from Dudley, that's like saying, I love you. I don't think you're a waste of space. And Harry's mind equals, I love you. What has Harry just done? He has showed this in spades. How so? He interprets what Dudley said. Did Dudley say anything about I love you? <laughs> he only used one of those words. And even then, he used it in a contraction. You're. <laughs> I don't think you're a waste of space. Actually, he used I too. But love wasn't in there anywhere. So what's Harry just done? He's interpreted Dudley's words to mean I love you. Does Dudley go, get out of here? No, he doesn't. <coughs> Dudley wants to know what's going to happen to Harry. He cares about Harry now. Okay? So how does Harry follow that up? After he interprets that, and by the way, if you've never seen this before, Harry does a lot of these kinds of interpretations throughout the course of the novels. Somebody will say something, and then Harry rephrases it in, in his own words. That's showing us Harry interpreting it. And he's always right. Okay? Right from Rowling's perspective. So, Dudley and them get ready to leave. And they're walking out. And Harry says to him, says to him, See ya, Big D. Why is that significant? Oh, and by the way, if you saw the movies, it's not included. This whole scene is excluded, which is utterly acid. Because it is central, central to the overall story arc of the novels. What does Harry mean when he says, see ya, big D? How do you know? Why doesn't he say, I love you too, Dudley? Come on, let's talk. Because they've been arguing their entire life. Okay. What's the indicator that it's really... Code language for, I love you. Big D. Who calls Dudley Big D? His gang of friends. Notice what Harry is saying there. I'm part of your posse. I'm part of your gang of friends. And what's important there? Who's the leader of the gang of friends? It's not Harry. It's Dudley. Harry's putting himself in a relationship there with Dudley that puts him beneath Dudley. In other words, he uses language Dudley can understand. Okay? And Dudley reaches out and shakes, come here, chill folks, and shakes Harry's hand. That's how important, how powerful that scene is. And it's completely left out of the film. That is Harry's recovery. And I would argue it's Dudley's too. That's Dudley's transformation. That's Dudley's redemption. Interestingly, Harry offers the exact same thing to Lord Voldemort at the end of the novel. And it's left out of the films. Probably because Lord Voldemort doesn't take it. He doesn't accept it. Harry, offers, Harry says to him, because they found out early in that novel if you've never read the, the novels, Lord Voldemort has split his soul by killing people. In, in the novels, if you kill somebody, you split your soul. That is, if you murder someone, if there's evil intent in, involved, you do that, you split your soul. Well, he's murdered a whole bunch of people, so his soul is pretty much fractured, okay? Well, there's a way to fix that. Yeah, they're the horcruxes. But there's a way to fix your soul to make it whole again. Why? Because the soul is supposed to be whole. It's supposed to be entire and complete. But how do you do that? Hermione points it out. You have to feel contrition. You have to be sorry for what you've done. She actually uses the verb, you have, or the noun, you have to be contrite. It's kind of interesting that Rowling actually uses that word. Why? 
because that is not a word used in regular everyday normal English conversation anymore. It is religious language. And that book is full of religious language. It's the word that dominates Psalm 151 by, by David in the book of Psalms. Excuse me, Psalm 51 in the book of Psalms. It's the psalm David composes after he's found out about sleeping with Bathsheba and ordering her husband murdered. Have mercy on me, O God, have mercy on me. It begins. That's the contrite part. Right? So, if you are contrite, if you're truly contrite, you can repair your soul. So at the end of the novel, Harry says to Voldemort, they're getting ready to have their all-out battle, you know? Be a man. Feel contrition. Feel sorry for what you've done. He says twice, be a man. What's he mean? He doesn't mean be macho. He means be a real human being. Because what's everything Voldemort's been attempting to do? Surpass. He wants to overcome humanity. He wants to rise above. That's why he wants to live forever and not die. Harry says... I've seen the real you. We won't talk about that. I've seen the real you. I've seen what you've become. Feel some contrition. Be a real man. Why? To be a real human is to do what? Feel. He's saying there. Louder? Feel. Feel? What else? Heal. Heal? What else? Take responsibility. You mess up, fess up. Pure and simple. <laughs> Admit it. Right? He won't. He won't. Why? It's beneath me. Okay? That's recovery. So let's escape. Because escape and recovery are related. Now, you said, you know, the books are escapist. Good or bad? That is, is it good or bad to be escapist? Most people say... Deal with your problems. Don't wish for La La Land, you know, fairy tale solutions to real world problems. Deal with the problems you have. Suck it up, face reality, and go on. Because escapism is what? It's a cop out. Well, what are modern forms of escapism? Drugs? Alcohol? Yeah, they're two major ones. You know, the quote unquote opi opioid crisis. The crisis isn't caused by people who have surgeries and such who need pain management. What's the crisis? The crisis isn't even of prescription drugs. It's illegal drugs that causes the opioid crisis. I've had major surgeries the last several years, partial shoulder replacements. You don't want to do that. Just never. I'm looking at knee replacements probably within five years. Right? I want a lot of opioids. <laughs> Believe me. I want enough Demerol so that I'm happy. <laughs> because when this wore off, I was not happy. <laughs> Pain. Like you can't believe. I wanted to escape. Is that a good healthy escape? No, that's not a good healthy escape. Because what happens when you sober up? If you're addicted, you go through withdrawal, you go through the DTs and such, okay? So how what really happens when you sober up? You got to do what? Take responsibility. Fate, take responsibility. You got to face reality. Harry Potter again. Harry faces Lord Voldemort, book four. He defeats him. And that evening, Harry's godfather, what's Harry just be able to go to bed and not worry about it, not think about it? Devil Burst says, nope. I need you to tell me everything that happened. He's like, come on, man, give him, give him a break. He goes, no. He needs to tell me everything. He needs to live it now. Why? So he doesn't have to relive it later. Okay? So what are the things we need escape from? Why do people take drugs? Why do people commit suicide? Because life sucks. For some, it sucks a whole lot worse than others. I'm not going to commit suicide. 
He was on the landing, the first wave invasion force of the Isle of Okinawa in World War II. So he not only fought the Japanese soldiers going ashore, but he was one of those who had to go into caves. hiding and he had nightmares 20 years later he never fully got over that you know PTSD and stuff like that, right? <laughs> what do we need escape from life okay let's break that down a little bit louder our past okay what else worry about the future worry about the future okay let's get a little more basic I mean these are all pretty big things isn't Stress caused by three-hour classes where you should <laughs> <laughs> shut up. You know? What else? I mean, that is one, right? You'd like escape right now. Just your everyday life, work, work, yeah. bills, cars. I've got how many cars do I have? Seven cars, six cars. None of them's newer than eleven years old. Some of them are closer to twenty years old. And it's, you know, bank account to mechanic. <laughs> okay. What else? Illness? Have any of you ever been really ill, really sick, really injured? Several years ago, I stepped out my garage door to put something in the trash can. It had snowed and was icy overnight. I stepped and whoosh, leg went up and I fell like this and totally severed my rotator cuff in my right shoulder. My arm just went, and then pain, I, I couldn't imagine. And didn't get to have surgery on it for 10 days. And they gave me aspirin. <laughs> Cruel bastards. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Pain, physical pain, physical ailment. What other things would you like to escape from? Pain. Emotional pain? Kids. Kids? <laughs> Tell me about it. <laughs> Got four, they're all adults. The two oldest ones in their 20s, still living at home, both done with their bachelor's degrees, doing professional stuff. You know, but once they're done with these, they're gone, gone, and they already know that. Yeah, you know, I'd like to have the house alone again, you know. What else? Hunger? Don't you think hunger is, you know, something a lot of people would like to escape from? Homelessness? I've got a guy I know, a friend. I haven't been in touch with him on Facebook quite a while. Several years ago, he had a regular job over a printing place in Franklin, lost his job, lost his apartment, got homeless, had a major heart attack, and then it just things cascaded. He's been essentially homeless since then. Through quote unquote, no fault of his own. Okay. Yeah, I'm sure he'd like to escape. And then what's the biggie? What's the real thing we all want to try to escape from? Anxiety? No. Nope. Present. Mm, close. Kind of more future. Death. Mortality. Harry's nemesis, the antagonist in the Harry Potter stories, what's his name? I used it several times. <laughs> or Voldemort, if you want to give it its kind of Frenchy pronunciation. What's it mean to flee or fly? That's the vol from Latin volare. De away out of death. mort death. You hope to escape death. Who doesn't? How many of you here right now, you're just really looking forward to it? Like, you know, you have a date with death already set. Eh, not many, right? Why do we fear death? Because as Shakespeare put in the immortal words by Hamlet, it's the undiscovered country from who's born no one returns. That is, if I were to close that door and we didn't have a window in there, and that door represented death. What's the problem? You go through. You, they don't come back and go, whoa, you really got to see this. 
and be a positive, right? Or they come back and go, don't do what I did, you know? <laughs> Jesus tells the parable of a rich man and Lazarus. The rich man won't give anything to Lazarus, who's the poor guy who lives at his door. Lazarus dies. He goes off to the bosom of Abraham, heaven. The rich man dies. He goes to hell. And the rich man goes, can Lazarus dip his finger in water and give me a drip? And the Abraham says, no. Okay, can you send him back to earth to talk to my brothers? Because I don't want him to suffer and I'm suffering. No. <laughs> no one comes back to explain. What's the best we get from quote-unquote life after death experiences? Yeah, you got all the chemical stuff going on in your brain, you know. If we accept consciousness as merely an electrical, electrochemical response in the brain. Closure? No. I don't mean it personally. People who have had, quote unquote, life after death experiences, what do they describe? Almost universally, almost always, what do they say they saw? A light. Usually a tunnel with a light at the end. And there's something drawing them. Now, some talk about, and as I went towards this tunnel and this light, I looked down, and there I was. Do, 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 do. You know, we're in the twilight zone, right? Okay. Some of these accounts are for people who were dead. Dead, dead. Not Princess Bride mostly dead. Dead, dead. For 20 minutes. I mean, they're... They said, you know, time of death, 843, wrote it down, started pulling the tubes and everything off, started getting ready to send the body maybe down for an autopsy, you know. In fact, one guy, it happened at the beginning of the autopsy. Guy starts making the cut and he wakes up. Ooh. Yeah. Better then than 20 minutes later. <laughs> <laughs> like, do you know if their brain died for 20 minutes? Yes, dead. I no brain waves, no heart waves. Nothing. You couldn't come back from like seven minutes. Like, or no, if your brain yeah, I know. completely die. Then... Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> There's been multiple clinical studies of this. Okay? So, death is the great escape that we want, Tolkien says. And he points out a lot of people say escape's bad. And he uses the, the image of the flight of the person in prison and the flight of the deserter. Well, what's the difference about being in prison and being a deserter? Deserter. What's a deserter? Why? He leaves his post, right? Or she. You have a job to do. You've agreed to do this job. The going gets tough and you get going. Okay. What about the prisoner? Okay, to use to go with the still the war the military analogy, you got caught, you got captured. Does that mean when you get thrown into prison, let's say prisoner of war camp, that because you're thrown in prison, you now have to go? I lost. I'm a horrible soldier. I got captured. I'm not going to do anything. I'm just going to run. No. What is every prisoner of war? At least in World War II, this was the case. What were they supposed to attempt to do? Get information. Escape. Escape. If you could get information while you're at it, all the better. But your number one job was to escape. Okay? There's a great film called Instinct. I think it's just Instinct. Cuba Gooding Jr. and um, Anthony Hopkins. Anthony Hopkins is playing an um, anthropologist. Studies of great apes in Africa. And he goes a little, you know, a little crazy studying these apes. He's out there. He's living with them. He lives with them for like four years. He eventually sheds all his clothes, and he's running around in the jungle like monkeys, like an ape, okay? And these poachers come in. And he kills the poachers because they kill one of the apes. He gets captured, sent back to the United States because he's an American citizen, and is sent to a prison in um, Florida, Starkville, I believe it is, okay? And Cuba Gooding Jr. is the psychologist assigned to him 
to determine whether or not he's sane enough to stand trial so that he can be put to death. Because yeah, you can't put to death someone who's not sane. you got to make sure they're in the right mind so that they know what's coming, essentially. Okay? And there's this beautiful scene where Cuba Gooding Jr. comes to visit him in his cell. And his cell is, you know, your 8 by 6 cell, three walls, Bar, iron bars here, and on the three walls are painted leaves and trees, floor to ceiling, no break. Okay. Why? You can put me in prison, but you can't take me out of the jungle. You can do all kinds of stuff to my body, but what can you not do? Unless I let you. That's, that's what Tolkien means. No matter what happens, appears in control. The last part, consolation. I mean, 20 minutes to go. I didn't think we'd go this long. Consolation. What's consolation? It's the prototypical happy ending to the fairy tale. Not, 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 not Disney. It is not Cinderella riding off with Prince Charming on the white horse. It is not Snow White with Prince Charming, the guy's a gigolo, you know, <laughs> going off to their castle. It is not Rapunzel with Prince Charming going off to where they go, etc., etc. So what does Tolkien mean by the happy ending? He says it's a consolation. What's a consolation? What does somebody do when they console you? They comfort you. Literally, what it means is they feel bad with you. It's, it's here. Let me feel bad with you. Why? Anybody familiar with the phrase misery? Loves company. You take a little bit of that misery away. Okay? So it's a consolation. And Tolkien says, I need a word to describe the kind of stuff that fairy tales do. And we don't have one. So I'm going to create one. And he creates the word U catastrophe. Bigger letters. E U C A T A S T R O P H E. Leave the U part off for a moment. Everybody knows what a catastrophe is. A catastrophe would be if I played the lottery and I won the Powerball $500 million. That would be a catastrophe, right? You're all looking at me with blank expressions like, what the hell are you talking about? That wouldn't be a catastrophe. That'd be thank you, Jesus. Catastrophe doesn't have to be a bad thing. But a catastrophe isn't. Literally, it's not a bad thing. The word catastrophe literally simply means a sudden change. If I were to win $500 million tonight, that would be a sudden change. <laughs> it would be so sudden, my head would still be spinning tomorrow. Or excuse me. Next Thursday, when you'd probably need a new instructor. <laughs> Either that or I'd come in and go, have some money. <laughs> okay? So you can have simple catastrophe, but how do we tend to use the word? Negatively. A catastrophe would be me slipping on the ice and breaking you know, your shoulder. A catastrophe would be driving home tonight and getting hit car accident. So, we have this catastrophe. That's the bad kind. Tolkien creates a you catastrophe. You're all familiar with this prefix, whether you are aware of it or not. Because you've heard a word that has this on it. Euphoria, which is, woo, feeling really high, really good. What else? You might use certain terms Euphemism. What does it mean? <laughs> Why do you use a euphemism? Like to sound better. To sound better. You don't say so and so <coughs> died. So and so what? Passed away. Passed away. In in the Orthodox Church, I'm Orthodox Christian. 
so-and-so reposed in the Lord. Like they laid down in Jesus' lap. They went away <laughs> softly. Right? Sounds a lot better than so-and-so. Croaked. <laughs> gave up the ghost. Kicked the bucket. You know, all those kinds of those are all examples of euphemisms. What else? Maybe you've been to a funeral or a memorial service and you've heard somebody say what? A eulogy. A good or beautiful logi word about the dead person. Because you don't hear dislogies. It's just not nice. <laughs> you don't go stand up and say, Sherman was a rotten SOB. You know, he gave me a C in that class and I deserved an A. Or, you know, you, you just don't hear that. No. Today, Twitter, if you die and you are a significant person in our society, depending upon your political spectrum, you're, you know, I don't care what you think of the Koch brothers and the Koch billions and there's causes they support. David Koch, one of the two Koch brothers, died last weekend. And people on the left, it was like, hallelujah, Satan is gone. Because of all of his corrupt money, you know, building cancer hospitals, and supporting gay rights, and, you know, all this horrible right-wing stuff that he's quote-unquote dead, right? So, eucatastrophe is a good or beautiful term. And Tolkien says, it's this kind of thing that fairy stories do really, really well. So what is that? He says, it is a sudden and joyous turn of events that you can't expect to ever happen again. Sudden and joyous turn of events that you can't expect to ever happen again. The Lord of the Rings has a huge, major, all-encompassing eucatastrophe. Anybody know what it is? Nope. That's a little eucatastrophe. This is the one the whole novel builds to. It's when Gollum falls into the cracks of doom. He bit the ring off Frodo's finger, and he's dancing around. He's so happy. I mean, we can talk about that if you want to. We can't really. And he what? He falls into the mountain. And he completes the quest. Frodo's a complete failure, by the way. Complete failure. Why? Because he gets to the point of actually doing it, and he says, I will take the ring. I will not do the thing I came to do. The ring is mine. Sauron, you know. Of course, he doesn't have any will anymore in the matter. He has no free choice at that point. Right? He got the ring that far. That's pretty good. So he's not totally a failure, but he's mostly a failure. Okay? <laughs> so that's an example of a eucatastrophe. Where is it in Star Wars? In the third film, I gave the example. When Darth Vader throws the Emperor. Where is it in the first Star Wars? He shuts off his targeting computer and he destroys the Death Star. Okay? There's going to be some in these novels. Where is it in Harry Potter? There's not one. There's multiple ones. Okay? Again, it's a sudden and joyous turn that you can't expect to happen again. Okay? First book. First Harry Potter novel. Where is it? Is it when Harry gets the stone from the mirror and puts it in his pocket? Because he knows how the mirror works. He keeps it away from Voldemort. That's a pretty good eucatastrophe. Or is it when he wakes up? Notice, three days later, he's been dead for three days, folks. But where did he go? He went down into the ground, and then he rose up again. Any symbolism? Oh, yeah, all kinds of stuff. Okay? So... That's eucatastrophe. So what's the happy ending? They live. They all lived happily ever after. Does Frodo live happily ever after? Nope. Why not? Does Jesus live happily ever after? Nope. 
And Tolkien, by the way, brings Jesus in at the very end of this, in the epilogue. Why? Because he says, the story in the Gospels, it's the greatest fairy story. It's the greatest fairy story there is. Why? Because there's no story more than like that everybody would wish to be true. That is, if you don't believe it's true, you'd really like something like that to be true. That somebody else is going to do what? Come and essentially solve all your problems. Come and make you better. Heal you. Take your quote-unquote sin, guilt, baggage, back, everything we want to escape from, take it all away. Right? But, that what's, so what's the happy ending? It's not everybody ends with a smile on their face. So if that's not it, what is it? Feeling of completeness. Completeness? Well, it's partially the notion that good ultimately prevails. Evil doesn't win. Even, Tolkien says, even in the face of much evidence to the contrary. There's a great Old English poem called The Battle of Malden. Again, Tolkien was an Old English scholar. Okay, And the Battle of Malden is based on an actual historical event. Englishmen fighting Vikings. And the Englishmen are horribly outnumbered. And the leader of the English troops, for all intents and purposes, is an idiot. Because, here's why. Here's a river... In the middle of the river is an island. The English are on the island. Right? It's a tidal river. Right? So the tide comes in, the river goes up, tide goes out, the river goes down. Right? When the tide goes down, there is a causeway, like a path, from one side, one bank, to the island. And it's just big enough you can cross single file over. When the tide's down. So the English pretty much have what here? Point. Yeah, they they have the proverbial high ground. So if the Vikings try to come over, what do you do? <clears throat> you just you know pick them off one by one, okay? Bertnoth, the leader of the English, says, "You could come over. We'll fight you. They're outnumbered, and they get slaughtered." Birtnoth is among the first ones killed. Well, you get towards the end of the poem, and you get this old, grizzled warrior. Beard's longer than mine. You know, he's got scars all over, like, what's his name in Harry Potter? He's probably only got two fingers on one hand. And he delivers this fantastic speech that essentially ends, as our numbers dwindle, as we get outnumbered, our hearts must be the fiercer, our courage the stronger, as our numbers lessen. In other words, he knows we're going to die. But he doesn't believe, ultimately, that the English, not this little battle, but the English nation will lose. So he says, fight on, boys. What's his point? His point is the same point that Winston Churchill made in his speech before Parliament in 1540, when England was not doing very well. And he said what? We'll fight them from the beaches. We'll fight them from the forests. We'll fight them from the streets. We'll fight them from the rooftops. We shall never surrender. In other words, no matter how bad it gets, we will fight. The happy ending is good ultimately will prevail. It might not for me, what happens with Frodo at the end of Lord of the Rings? He leaves Middle Earth. Why? He cannot be healed there. He has too many pains. Every October 6th, his shoulder hurts. Why? Because that's where he got stabbed in the arm. Every March, I don't remember the exact date, his neck hurts. Why? That's where he got bit in the neck by she on the spider. So the only way he gets his healing is to leave Middle-earth and go off to where the gods dwell. Okay? 
So why is all this important? Because everything we're reading in here is what Tolkien considered a fairy story. He called them fairy stories. The word that he often uses throughout the essay is fantasy. Fantasy. It's imaginative literature that involves things that do not exist in our real world, that some author has created. And when the author created that, the author creates a story, a world, that when we read, use, use computer technology, our brain does what? We sub-partition our hard drive. And we make a little part up here that reads, Pradane. And while we're reading, we are in there. And if the story is written well, the whole time we read, we're there. Have you ever read something? I should have asked this. Because I find a few of you to have asked. Have you ever read something where you felt like you were part of the story? Okay. That's what an author wants. First time I read Lord of the Rings, couldn't get into it. I had to explain this to a student in my class Monday night. He said, you know, first time I read it, I put it down after, I don't remember, 25, 30 pages. I'm boring. Didn't do it. Second time, I got up a little bit more. Third, I think it was third time I tried. I got about 100 pages. It does, wasn't doing it. I gave it one more try because my siblings, I think, said something about it. And that time, I read it from beginning to end in like two days. The whole thing. That's like 1,200 pages. I wasn't a huge reader then. And it, why? Because when I got to the scene where Aragorn, Legolas, and Gimli are chasing after Merry and Pippin, who are in the company of the orcs. I uh, was here more late with Sigmund, and I was tired. And people could be talking. I'm like, la, 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 la. I didn't, you know, I wasn't aware. That's what an author wants. And if the author is a good author, and Tolkien is the master, okay, Lloyd Alexander's not Tolkien, but he's up there. If the author is a good author, the author will keep you there throughout the entirety of whatever the novel is. If the author is a bad author, there will be inherent little faults that kind of make your brain go, Aah! because you go, wait, 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 wait. It was said earlier on page, and you find a problem in the writing, a disconnect. And if this were Harry Potter course, I would go through and point out all the problems in J.K. Rowling's writing. There's a ton of them in the Harry Potter novels. J.K. Rowling is the kind of writer you want to sit around a campfire with. She will keep you entranced. But she's not a great writer. She wasn't, let me put it that way, with the Harry Potter novels. Read her detective novels. In my opinion, they're perfect. Her Cormor and Strike detective novels, which get really dark. I mean, you see bad side of humanity. They're superb. No problems at all. Okay. The other novelists that we'll be reading, Garth Nix and Stroud, they just raise the bar. Okay. You'll get into those, I hope, and just kind of like, the whole world expands. Yes? I have a quick question. Sure. So it's you catastrophe, and I think uh -huh. that's when something, like basically that's the dead of the world. Yes. Well, like, okay, you know how sometimes you look, somebody dies, is that called, but it's still, like, catastrophic? That's, that That's would the, be catastrophic. That, that can be a new catastrophe. Okay. Let me give you an example, since we're not doing Lord of the Rings in this class. Gandalf's death in the Lord of the Rings. Sorry, I gave that away if you've never read it. Gandalf dies. How is that a new catastrophe? You can't expect it to happen again, right? Kind of. He comes back. How does he come back? He's not Gandalf the Grey. He dies, Gandalf the Grey. He comes back, Gandalf the White. Okay? So what started that? How come he dies? You got to go back to a little, and I know we're running out of time, a little teeny tiny detail 
that Tolkien puts in in the chapter of the Mines of Moria. They're going through these dark mines. They come to this big room. It's a guard room. And there's a pit. Where it once been a well. And if you're anything like me, and you find a well or a very deep hole in the ground, you want to see how deep it is. <laughs> you're curious. Okay. Well, the youngest member of the troop, Pippin, drops a rock. And they hear, after he drops it, Gandalf says, fool of a took, next time throw yourself in. And almost immediately thereafter, they hear hammers. <laughs> you woke something up that should not have been woken up. <laughs> That's what causes Gandalf's death. You could even argue the dropping the rock. That's a little new catastrophe that leads to a bigger new catastrophe that leads to a bigger new catastrophe. Etc. 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 Okay, so yes, Tolkien also says about the new catastrophe that it reveals something. It gives a glimpse of joy, joy beyond the confines of the world. What does he mean, joy beyond the confines of the world? Those of you who read the Harry Potter stories, you can put your hands up. I just want to see how many. Okay, so quite a few of you. In book five, when they go to the Ministry of Magic, what's the first room in the Department of Ministries, Mysteries, that they go into? Anybody remember? It's the death room. Because death is a mystery, right? Well, what is what do they see in that room? There's an archway, right? And hanging from that archway is a veil. They go in the room. The room doesn't have air conditioning. They're wizards. They don't have electric. Okay. But the veil is doing what? It's waving. And two people, at least, hear something. Moody hears voices. She's crazy. <laughs> and Harry hears voices. What are the voices? It's the voice of Close. Wait, say that again. We both experienced death. Not Harry and okay, you, you, you didn't say what I thought you said. I thought you said people who've experienced death. In other words, people who died. The voices are those beyond the veil. What's the veil? Death. They're hearing the dead speak. How do we know? Well, Luna talks to Harry afterwards. Says, Come on, Harry. You know, the, the, the dead people. And he's like, what are you talking about, Luna? She goes, it's not like we're not going to see him again. Like, what do you mean? How are we going to see the dead people again? Well, she's talking about what? Life after death. Harry acts like, I've never heard of this. What is this life after death of which you speak, you know? So that later on when he goes to his parents' graveyard and there are two pieces of scripture on one on his parents' grave and one on Dumbledore's sister's and mother's grave. And the last that shall be overcome is death. Harry's like, well, that's like death eater talk. Hermione's like, no, 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 Harry, come on. It's, it's resurrection. It's, you know, everybody rises from the dead. Everybody gets to see Jesus. It doesn't matter whether you love him or not, you know. And he's like, huh? What are you talking about? I've never heard of this Jesus. Who is this man? Okay. She portrays him as being a total tabula rasa, blank slate, so to speak. Um, so, joy beyond the confine of the world. That's part of that Christian stuff that he brings in later with the epilogue. Tolkien was a thoroughgoing Catholic. He believed in lock, stock, and barrel. He tells us in his letters that the Lord of the Rings became, through revision, a Thoroughly Catholic work. So he, he's putting Catholic ideas, not people. Jesus is never mentioned. God isn't mentioned. Mary isn't mentioned, etc. Okay? So joy beyond the confine of the world is kind of the lifting aside of the veil, getting a glimpse of heaven, so to speak. Okay? But it's a joy that pierces. 
that kind of joy would kind of be, you know, ooh, piercing. All right, other questions? Because we're three minutes over. All right, so next week, all of the Black Cauldron in three quick hours. Or maybe not so quick.